Thank you. It is 6.37. I'm going to call this meeting to order right now. We are working to get Zoom back on. We do have one counselor participating remotely. Um, I'm going to read the chair's statement. <clears throat> this meeting is being recorded by the City Council and GCTV 15. If any other present are doing the same, you must notify the chairperson at this time. In accordance with MGL Chapter 30A, subsection 20G, no person shall address a meeting of a public body without permission of the chair, and all, press, all persons shall, at the request of the chair, be silent. No person shall disrupt the proceedings of a meeting of a public body. If after clear warning from the chair, a person continues to disrupt the proceedings, the chair may order the person to withdraw from the meeting, and if the person does not withdraw, the chair may authorize a constable or other officer to remove the person from the meeting. Um, and when you're ready, if we could get a roll call of the members. Councillor Golub. Here. Vice President Gwynn. Here. Councillor DeSorger. Here. Councillor Bottomley. Here. Councillor Bullock. Here. President Gilmore. Here. Councillor Lapiansky. Here. Councillor Mayo. He was participating on Zoom, which seems to be down. Councillor Healy. Here. Councillor Elmer. Here. Councillor Forgy. Here. Councillor Ricketts. Present. Councillor Toronzo. Here. Madam President, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, and next, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and this is Terry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. All right, um, so I'm gonna remind counselors, um, I know it, it, during roll call, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but you have to have your microphone on when you say that you're present. Um, folks at home and watching through GCTV or via Zoom when it comes back, won't be able to hear you if your microphone's not on. Okay, um, do I have a motion to approve the May 16, May 18, May 19, June 5th, and June 15 minutes? So moved, Ricketts. Second, 4G. Great. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Great. Um, next, we have communications from the Superintendent of Schools and School Committee. Oh, no, please take mine. <laughs> we won't. Hi, everybody. It's been a few months mm -hmm. since we've seen you all in person. Um, we didn't prepare anything ahead of time other than we're hoping that you all have had a chance to review the NESDEC uh, report we had uh, done for the schools. It includes both an enrollment. I'm sorry, and Chair. Chair Perry, can you scoot the mic over oh, sure. a little closer? Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, the, the NESDEC report includes both an enrollment projection for the district, as well as a really comprehensive assessment of the facilities within the schools, including Green River. Um, we're about to, as a school committee, begin a process, re restart the process we had started at some point previously, I believe in 2020, uh, regarding uh, uh, redistricting discussions uh, talking about which students go to which elementary schools, how our elementary schools are organized. Those are just top of the list things. There are many other things we would put into that category. We're also, as a part of redistricting, going to begin with a public uh, comment process as part of the, the meetings to um, gauge the public's uh, interest in certain topics that we want to cover. But Certainly, to begin the discussion, we'd like to hear any comments or questions that you all have about the study. And I would ask the superintendent to add anything she might want to add. 
there are just a variety of questions that were posed early on when I started here, including um, could we get the fifth grade back get to the elementary level as the chair spoke about what's the best way to organize our elementary schools and also questions about do we take this opportunity to reconsider start times, especially for our secondary level. So um, those are just some of the questions that we'd like and felt that it made sense for the state of the buildings to be assessed. And that's what NASDAQ did and provided options for the school committee to consider. There's no decisions that are made in the report, just points for further discussion and um, highlights and challenges for each of the options. Thank you. Do any councilors have any questions? The schools, yes, Councilor Ricketts. Uh, yes, thank you so much for sharing that information. And I wondered, are are you gonna make these decisions as a school committee or are you doing like parents groups and some school committee members or how do, how do you think you're gonna go about these that's are big a, issues? Yeah, that's a really important question. So we, we have structured the committee as an advisory committee so that it can include people beyond the school committee as members. Uh, Vice Chair Jean Wall uh, is the, going to chair the redistricting process um, with uh, uh, Superintendent DeBarge um, and also our partners from TMS will be involved as well in, you know, putting some of the, the planning together. And then in terms of um, how it will be structured, I'm going to leave that up to Vice Chair Wall. She can make that decision. Um, but we have made sure we can include um, folks on the committee who are not school committee elected members. Um, and then regarding getting input, everyone's welcome to give input and that will be the first part of the process as we begin to meet. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. yes, thank you. Is there anybody else who have any questions for the schools? Yes, Councilor DeSorger. So just reading through it, it looked like the Green River school was the one that was probably going to need them if if that were that would have been the most expensive one to to i know that you don't have the numbers but it looked like there was a lot of things there that hadn't been done correct there are a number of factors that would have to be considered with green river but the primary start for that would be to get some engineering studies done to look at the electrical to look at um, all of the infrastructure in that building before final decisions are made. But as you can see, if I'm recalling um, all the detail correctly, most of our elementary schools would require some modification for handicapped accessibility um, at minimum. So I don't want to say that it would be the most expensive, but I think it's very fair to say we need to evaluate the capital that would need to go into any of these options. Yes, go ahead. And, and you're going to have a tour. Is that right? We're going to go look at, oh, is that a plan, part of a plan or not? We haven't gotten to the specifics of okay. the makeup of that yet, but I know Vice Chair Wall will be um, talking with me about structuring everything going forward. Great. And then did I see Councillor Healy? Yeah. I noticed in the report that. Uh, Four corners, two classrooms were being eliminated. What was the plans for those students? What schools are they going to? Can you tell me what page you're on? Sure. If I can find it again. <laughs> it was uh, page 62. Oh, sorry, that was Newton School. That was the next question. It was page 55. Okay. That actually would be a recommendation from NASDAQ mm -hmm. going forward. So okay. that's not current. That would be looking at the actual um, operating capacity, the number of students that they would recommend that really should be educated in that building. Mm -hmm. We're not making any of these changes for next school year. Okay. And then the next one was Newton School. It looked like there was a need for an additional kindergarten class. Um, so, you know, what's do we have a plan there? Or? That is happening for that next is happening? year. Yes, okay. that's solely based on enrollment. And we do have um, 
we do have that planned. Okay. And I, you know, going, there was a lot of information in here and I went through it um, quite a bit actually. And um, I, I found an interesting note in there about the high school roof needing replacement in five locations already. And it's only, it was built in 2015. It's less than 10 years old. Um, the warranty period on craftsmanship in Massachusetts is 10 years. A lot of people don't know that. And roofs have a 20 year to 30 year life cycle. Um, so we should engage our central maintenance crew to go after the warranty work before we have to pay for it. Um, and the other surprising thing was a, a lot of the ADA accessibility in the schools and what we're doing to address that. As I had um, shared, that's gonna be a significant um, undertaking to evaluate truly the cost of addressing all of those issues. Yep. Um, one of the things we're hoping can be accomplished is that potentially some of the rooms like nurses offices that need to be ADA compliant mm -hmm that we'll be able to reconfigure the schools potentially so that we can move those places um, and address the ADA compliance issue while being as economical as possible. But that, that's one of the questions I certainly have. And I, I, I thought all four options were pretty good options. Obviously, um, the Green River School is probably the most expensive out of all of them. Um, personally, I really like the idea of having kindergarten and first grade in the same school and having all the same support system there. I thought that was a really good idea. No, I would have never thought of that. So I just want to say they did a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other counselors have questions for the schools? Yes, Councilor Ricketts. Okay, my last one is I just really want to thank you for tackling that big issue about cell phones and you know, there's no opinion from this table. We'll stay in our lane gladly. But um, as somebody who has an employee in the family, it, I'm glad for it. And I know it's going to be a struggle a little bit, but no, I thank you for introducing it and best of luck with it. Yes, Councilor Lopansky. Um, just to note that it doesn't take a study of that magnitude um, to consider the idea of moving the secondary school to a later start time, you could meet in a couple of weeks and just decide to do that and it would make everyone's GPA go up. the beginning of the next academic year did we we set a date august 23rd august 23rd um we will uh have a detailed information we will not tour every school extensively we'll show highlights um but we want you as well as the school committee and, and planning and construction to be a part of that tour if you want to be it will be obviously voluntary um and that is 4.30 start time, is that right? Yes. August 23rd, 4.30, we'll send out information. Yeah, but thank you, that reminded me, Councillor. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Tronzo. I uh, just follow up on that, was that, you said, so it's 4.30 start time, you'd like, like, a, like a tour of all of them? Yeah, um, yes, I'll be doing a step roll. Okay. Um, we or, hadn't intended that with this. This was intended to the show, open. yes, sure. show folks what we've done with the capital okay. um, money that has been allocated to the schools over the years, um, and to highlight the nice work that the custodians have done. So, and to give everybody an opportunity to look at some of the improvements that are identified in this report that need to be addressed. You know, the sure. changes, the ADA piece. Yeah. So it was really more, but I'm sure we can, can, I'm quite sure that Vice Chair Wall has considered tours in her planning for moving forward with the NESDAQ study. Okay. And when the time comes to see Green River again, we did do a tour less than a year ago 
for I think for planning and construction. Right. And when the time comes again that we need to look at it again, we'll include everyone that needs to be included. And obviously that, that would be city council as well. Cool. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be good to see where I mean I know that there's been it was that that tour was before I was I was here. But, it was, uh, you're right. It yeah. was right before. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, of, I, last so year. Thank you. You're right. Personally, I I just yeah. I know that uh, investments have been made into that building up till now, and I know that we're not quite there yet. But it would be nice to see what those. Yeah, and to be honest, I think that having it be closed for a period of time has created more expense than sure. was originally expected when we talked about the need for the replaced HVAC system. Um, there's other upgrades that obviously need to happen in that building before it could open besides right. the HVAC, which was part of the, uh, the tour we did at the end of last year. Yeah. Um, so, and there's no question, regardless what the schools or the city decides to do, with that building, we'll all have to look at it at least a few more times. <laughs> right. Okay, next, Thank I had you. Councillor Healy, but I want to let folks know someone from home texted me and told me that our audio is cutting out. So if we can be careful to speak into the mics um, so that they can hear us at home, that would be great. Just to follow up on the Newton School um, kindergarten class, was that decision made prior to the budget and allocation of funds per school or was that made after? Are they going to be short? money because we decided to add another kindergarten class after the budget? No, actually I had um, worked with Ms. Goodwin who was there at the time and we had anticipated the need for one additional teacher. We weren't sure which grade level um, the enrollment was gonna break at. So we did anticipate the need for the staff. Thank you. All right, did I see anyone else? All right, great. All right, well, thank you as always. All right. <clears throat> okay, next I have communications from Mayor City Officers and Employees, and I am told that Eric Torog is available for folks. He's on Zoom though, isn't he? Okay. That would be great. Um, You can, you said, yes, yes, yes. Um, and hopefully we're getting this connection up soon. Good evening, Council. Nice to see you here this evening. Yeah, I know it's hot and this is a really nice place to be because <laughs> it's nice and cool. Um, yeah, the little dingy dongies from my phone, my apologies. I, I um, contacted Fernando who's on vacation, but um, he has uh, texted Jane and it, they're working on the uh, problem, but it looks like it is a GCTV issue. So not necessarily one that uh, we can control from, from here. I mean, I don't know what they're doing, quite frankly. That's just Nick and Jean are working on the problem. So I uh, don't have a lot to tell you this evening. Um, yes, I had asked Eric uh, to be here this evening in case you had count, uh, questions uh, regarding your uh, cannabis zoning that's coming up. So I was going to say, uh, and I've uh, mentioned this to President Gilmore, he could only be on for a short period of time. Um, I don't, uh, I haven't heard from him one way or the other in terms of his ability to get on the meeting. So um, he would be, he would have been here to answer your questions uh, in during this time, if you had any, it's possible I could answer some of them and I can certainly record what they are and he can get the answers to you, um, I'm sure by tomorrow. So um, we'll do the best we can. And, and if he shows up because we fixed the problem, that'll be great. Um, I, um, okay, uh, I do have, uh, 
a shout out to the health department. And I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but they've just received a $300,000 grant from the Department of Public Health. Um, it is a testimony to the quality of the work that our health department uh, does. Um, and that is under the direction of uh, health director Hoffman. And uh, it is a multi-year grant. So they will have this grant for several more years. I think it's, I think it's more than three years. And it is to ensure that smaller surrounding communities have the ability to access quality um, health people uh, with their questions and so forth. Most of these, and it encompasses uh, um, Leverett and a Shootsbury. So our health department will be assisting the um, executive offices, because I'm not sure what they have for a health department. Boards of selectmen often serve in that capacity. Um, but anyway, they are available to them to, uh, to provide them with assistance to ensure that they have the professional assistance they need to address many of the health issues that have that come up. Uh, within a community, and these are communities that don't have the ability to do that. So it was a, a grant that Director Hoffman uh, applied for, uh, at the, mostly at the request of the Department of Public Health, and um, she was able to uh, receive that grant. So um, I have, uh, I will be here for a while myself. I know you have the audit coming up. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have uh, on that. And I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Um, there are any counselors who have questions? Yes, Council Ricketts. Okay, good evening, Mayor. I have a couple. Um, my first one is I do wanna do a shout out to Director Hoffman for all that she's done still through COVID, she's still going strong, taking care yeah. of lots of things here. Um, also, Nancy Bershaw. So people should know that she does more than just the health department. She does a lot in this city with the YMCA and other things. Um, she leads with her heart and with her finances. And so she will be missed, but I thank her so much for her service. Also, um, a shout out to the rec department. For the 4th of July, it was nice for everybody to be back again. Oh, yeah. And to our licensing department committee, because, you know, people have to go before them to do more things at the fairground, whether it be the cannabis fair or the tag sale that was put on with WHAI or different things. I've never seen our fairgrounds used as much as they are right now. So it's, it's great that everybody's working together and doing all of these things. And I am now walking a little better because um, I played pickleball for the first time. And <laughs> I have to say that I love it and I do need to get in shape, but I hope that we can do something to make it, um, if somebody Googles it, they can find out where that is. I had some friends visiting from California and they were telling me all about pickleball and I was like, Oh, I only know Dr. Nathan Shore has it at his house. And I didn't know about the great, you know, the other mm -hmm. place at the time. So now that I do, and it was so funny that I just went there Saturday and then in today's A paper. Point of order. What does yeah, this can, have to I'm do? I'm sorry, with... could we could we keep it to um council business? I mean, this yes. is if you have a yes, mayor. because this Ooh. is for <laughs> stuff that I want done, and it only is done through the mayor's office. Okay. Okay. And then I won't even bring up the drought because I'm bringing the pails in my shower with me. So I'm fine. <laughs> we're going to have a no drought ordinance. All right. Did anybody have any well, questions? I, I, I guess I need to know from Councillor Ricketts. So you're saying you want more pickleball courts in the city of Greenfield? No, I just want it. Like oh. when you Google it, it shows that. Oh, we, yeah. Address. Okay. Good. Yep. I mean, I, I'm not opposed to more pickleball ball courts, so, but they the, cost money. So. Nope, just just a, you know, just something. It'll so. be time to develop the um, capital budget before you know it. So nope. we'll see. 
Vice President Gwynne, did I see you putting your hand up? Yeah, um, I had some questions for um, Mr. Torog um, uh -huh. in concern to uh, the cultivation changes, mm -hmm. um, not as much as they pertain to the future thoughts, because um, <sighs> I'm pretty confident in that. It's the people that have already invested on Leiden Road and have their facility um, built and ready to go forward. Just what what's involved in any of these changes that could negatively impact their investment that they've already made. And that was just point of clarification. Are you going to ask me the questions? So that no, that was really the question. I mean, I wanted to make sure that there was some protections. You know, what, you know, if we make these these changes that are here tonight um, to protect the Country Club Road area and other facilities that are mm -hmm. uh, requesting something by right. I just want to make sure that it wouldn't have um, any negative impact on someone that's already been approved, followed the directions, doing it well, has a facility that look, you know, is a, a very good location for it and is already ready to begin. And, you know, there was some talk. I just wanted to find out where that would lie because I I just came from there um, and checked in with them. So that was it. It was those kind of more general questions to make sure that we're not going to um, negatively affect someone that's done it correctly and done it right and ready to begin their um, project or not project business and and then say okay we we changed we're changing the thoughts so that was okay. some questions so did you get those answers from no i was hoping to ask him this oh. evening okay so well if you want to give them to me i'll okay i'll uh oh um Mayor, would happy like to write them down, down or if you okay. just want to email them to me. All right, uh, you know, we'll, I'll follow up, but if he was able to hear my, my oh. thoughts or <laughs> um, before we get there, but um, yeah. that was it. I okay. just want clarification for uh, some constituents that I, uh, you know, have been in conversation with and uh, even talked to today. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm told that uh, Kathy Scott texted me and she said that people can hear and see us. We just can't see them right now. So if this gets resolved, hopefully he'll be able to come in and answer that question for you. And then I had Councillor Elmer next. You know, I'm not an expert, but my understanding is that they would be grandfathered in because, like you say, they follow the existing rules. Thank you. I think that's true for the one that has the permit. Any further changes that might uh, they might want to do might be impacted by the tier one change. I think that's the short version of what could happen. So if they're all set and their permit is working, then they can, uh, I mean, they're working with their permit, within their permit. Um, then I think they would be grandfathered, yes. Yes. Seeing we're getting specific in that thought, my thought is um, if they were to um, want to expand in the future, would that then be only available by special permit or was it in their initial plan? So that was one. And of I don't know the answer to that because I haven't seen uh, their conditions that the planning board set or what they might have said uh, to them what the overall plan was and so I'm, i don't know the answer and i'm not sure i mean eric might have more information that would help answer that question okay and that's you know i don't think there's a problem with them going through the process i just want to make sure there's a process for them hey there's there's Kathy. this is a good sign i think yeah i think we see people <laughs> from zoom <sighs> all right um so if eric Torog is on maybe he can answer that question yes i can answer that question wonderful thank you so councillor Gwen, uh, the question is a good question the approved development marijuana cultivation facility at 493 leiden road would in fact be grandfathered it would become a legal non-conforming use 
if the city council would be to adopt the tier one limit. There is a process for them to expand, even as a legal non-conforming use. That's section 600.1 in the zoning ordinance, which allows the zoning board to grant a special permit for that. So there is a process. Thank you. Does that answer your question? It does. If, if anything pops up within, I might have some, but that was my main concern was just to make sure that being proactive doesn't have a negative reaction to somebody that's done it and done it to what we asked. Great. All right. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Councilor Disorder? Good evening, Mayor. I just had a question about the, um, it reminded me of it when someone was speaking about the city website, how the new website oh, right. design. And um, just if you could give us a little update on where we were with that and if, you know, that's been tested out or. Okay, I, I can do that. And thank you for reminding me. Uh, we are nearing the end of the process with Revise. Uh, they have um, basically transferred over all the information that's going to be on the website. Um, we hope to be able to launch that website by September. So um, stay tuned. It's been a, um, an interesting process to work with, uh, with them and an interesting process to uh, decide how what the amount of information on the website can be. I mean, we have we had information that went back many, many, many years, pages that didn't work, uh, different things, which is what we knew. And now we have we will have a, a really wonderful looking. I only I've only been able to see the um, sort of different iterations of how the pages are going to look. But I think everybody's going to be really pleased with uh, with the product. So as I said, I think we have about a very shortly the work that needs to be done on the work will actually be done internally. And I will say that uh, Caitlin Von Schmidt has been uh, the person that has been um, managing this project with Revise. She's been doing a wonderful job. It, it happens to fit her overall skill set very well. And uh, Aaron uh, Kupek, uh, our communications director, has been working alongside of her. So um, I think that everybody's going to be pleased with what we see. Um, and we have made a special uh, investment, I would say, in making it uh, ADA compliant as well. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to an actual live version myself. So. We'll let you know as soon as we, uh, as soon as we're ready to launch. In fact, probably even give you a quick presentation in, uh, if not the September meeting, um, I'm hoping shortly thereafter. Great, thank you. Are there, yes, Councilor Tronzo. Um, I guess I should start with, uh, forgive my naivety if I'm, I didn't see the, uh, the the grant you were talking about that uh director hoffman mm -hmm. was able to to come come upon um you were talking about uh, as it being a supplement to areas like leverett and shootsbury mm -hmm. um so i guess the the way to phrase this is are we i know that we're obviously a county seat um are we <coughs> From this, you said it's three hundred thousand dollars. Is that what it was? Three hundred thousand dollars over several years. Over several years. So that is, is per year. So we have three hundred thousand dollars. I don't know. As soon as we get the money, and I'm not sure that we actually have it in house yet. Is so? Is there a um like a descriptor of what that money is is being used for locally? Uh, and I, by I mean locally, I don't mean countywide. I mean in our in our city itself. Um, and the re it, it, it's for no other reason than to, to say, are, are we, even if we're getting more money, are we, ex are we stretching our own resources out beyond our, our borders, so to speak? Um, or, or is some of that coming to our 
local, real, like local needs. Um, I'm like, looking, how does that impact us I'm, locally? I'm really looking hard here for that information <laughs> because sure. we have an excellent, I don't think the press release has gone out, so don't feel right. bad. Okay. But it's about to go out uh, if you don't. But um, I, I, I haven't yeah. seen anything from it. Yeah. So I know I have it here somewhere. And my apologies for not having it up. But, um, the only reason I say it is I know that our in in the past few years but the, we've but been short. It's not going to stress our resources. That's why we have the three. Uh, why we have the three hundred thousand dollars. So I mean, apart from the fact that um, Leverett and Shutesbury are not exactly. It's not Montague. Right. <laughs> Le Leverett's as closer than Shutesbury. Sure. But um, apart from that, no. It, it's really to provide and advise uh, assistance and um, do advise them on how best to handle any uh, health issues that come up that they are not able to handle. So I was um, just wondering how that kicks back essentially to us. Yeah. As we are not like, and again, maybe I'm misreading this, but we're not, we're not FERCOG. So no, we're not no. responsible for the county in that way so if our department secures a grant that is covering other communities and i'm not against like sharing sharing the wealth so to speak um, on these things and working as you know multiple communities together i'm just my concern would be if there's nothing to pad us on in some way whether it be staff or otherwise um, why would we allow our department, which has in the, especially the, the immediate history been stretched really, really thin and not been allowed for one reason or another to do its job effectively. And I feel like we're just getting back to the, to the baseline of being able to do that effectively. I don't want to see without any extra staff or anything, um, us stretching ourselves too thin is I guess my concern with or without $300,000, if there's not gonna be something that's supportive in our own city itself. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the, just not, I mean, again, I haven't seen this release or right. the, the, um, the ins and outs of, of what that grant is going towards and how it would affect our staffing. So that was why I was asking yeah. the question. Our, um, I can read you from the grant letter our uh, health department, because we are the county seat and we do have an actual full and functioning health department with inspectors and nurses and so forth. We work regularly with Montague all the time. We share resources there. They come through grants. That's, that's how it's done. And, um, and they are for specific types of things. Uh, so what's, and we work with Deerfield too often. It's not, to be the health department for those communities in any way. Uh, it is to provide them with the professional assistance that they have. I mean, both Deerfield, all of these communities, uh, and we work with Sunderland already, all of these communities are also part of FERCOG. So they get many resources from there. This was a special request from the Department of Public Health or uh, to meet certain um, local uh, guidelines that have come down. I'm going to read to you from this uh, that um, that cannot be covered by these smaller communities. So uh, we are pleased to notify you as as a lead municipality for Greenfield, um, in parentheses Deerfield, Leverett, Montague, Shutesbury, Sunderland, that you have been awarded a public health excellence for shared services grant in an annualized amount of, it's not quite 300, <laughs> 296,750, pending negotiation of a final work plan through this funding and your continued support. We hope to give municipalities the resources to strengthen the local public health system, to align the recommendations of the Special Commission on Local and Regional Public Health, the Office of Local and Regional Public Health at Massachusetts Department of Public Health will contact uh, Jennifer Hoffman, Greenfield Public Health Director, to negotiate a contract for the remainder of the year. I think when that contract is negotiated, 
uh, we can give the council a much better answer as to what specific services are going to be provided and how they're going to be provided. So I would recommend I, I can, you know, that you have Director Hoffman come at some point in the near future and, and give you that information. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Councillor Elmer, I saw you next. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually before him, but whatever. Uh, okay, you can go next after Councillor Elmer. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that Councillor Mayo has his hand up. Oh. Okay, all I can see is Kathy Scott. I'm sorry. Um, so Councillor Lapiansky and then Councillor Mayo. Um, so my, my, my question is more or less the same as uh, Councillor Terenzo's, but you didn't answer his question. Um, so I'm going to put it more simply. What is the benefit to Greenfield of taking on this task? Mayor? I'm not, I'm not, not going to answer your question. I was just looking to see if I had further information in a particular email. I think the benefit of, of Greenfield is uh, we are the uh, deposit, <laughs> we are the health department that's been recognized by the State Department of Public Health to be able to assist the smaller communities around us when they need it under this particular grant. That is not something that's unusual at all. And I must say it was something that uh, we all worked very closely together during COVID. Much of that was grant funded through the CARES Act and other FEMA and NEMA uh, grant money. It's uh, not unusual for a lead municipality, as they've identified us, to assist the smaller communities around us that don't have access to the kinds of health, uh, public health expertise that we do. So I think the benefit, for lack of a better word at the moment, is more intrinsic as well as uh, they're going to do actual work. And as I said, um, they will work out the contract. And uh, I think that it's, uh, it's, if nothing else, a great honor for the city of Greenfield and a recognition of the work of the health department. So just to be clear, the question was, what is the benefit to Greenfield? And for the citizens watching, the answer was, there is no benefit to Greenfield from taking on this task. No, that's not the answer at all. I said to you. You did not identify any benefits to the taxpayers of the city of Greenfield. Mr. Lopiansky, I believe that uh, the work of the health department in the last few years speaks for itself. So I'm thinking since counselors do have questions about this grant, it would be a good idea to have Director Hoffman present, um, perhaps at next month's meeting, I could invite her if that's fine with you. I think that's a good thing. Okay, because I would like to learn a little bit more about how that works. Um, okay, was there anyone, else? oh, I'm sorry, I had, I had recognized Councilor Mayo, he's on Zoom. Councilor Mayo. We... Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes thank you. Okay. My question is for the mayor. Uh, hello, hello, Mayor. I have two questions for you. Um, first off, uh, I would like to commend you on the, uh, the work that you've done, uh, or not you personally, but uh, you've worked on, or that you had worked on uh, the uh, rollout of the, uh, the, the new website and uh, that it being uh, ADA compliant. Um, that is, uh, very, uh, very important to a lot of people here in town uh, that they have access, uh, uh, people with disabilities have access to the uh, town website and that it's uh, usable and uh, uh, functionable for them uh, is very important. Uh, my second uh, question to you is um, the, the council basically zeroed out the amount for uh, the uh, the open party's uh, salary for the year 2003. And here we are on June 20th. And I would like to know um, how these people are being paid if they're, if the council zeroed out that amount. Uh, 
Um, I, I think what he's talking about is the cut in the police department. And uh, out of the salaries. <laughs> Point of order, I can't hear Councillor Mayor. My, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Councillor Mayor okay. was asking how police officers are being paid since there was a reduction in the wages line. And I think we're going to get a more thorough update on that next month. Yes, I think so. Um, too. But if I mean, if you want to take a stab at the question, I mean, Councillor Mayo, was that was that the, the question you were asking? That is correct. Yeah, I think okay. that is the question he was asking. But well, we've had a, a number of things happen. And I mean, I can give you an overview um, of it. And I believe you're right. I think we had a meeting and we decided that he would give you an update um, probably in August as to where they're at. We've had a, a number of things happen in the police department that uh, do allow, I, actually, AC Gordon was here earlier. Is he still here? I'll be sure of what the latest and greatest is. Can you hear? <clears throat> Am I? Yes, that's perfect. Okay. Uh, so the question was where the cuts are being affected right now? And how you're paying you two police officers. Yeah, he was asking how specific officers were staying on payroll despite the cuts to the wages line. Uh, right now, they're, uh, the chief is on administrative leave, um, and everybody is employed right now, except uh, Officer Gordon, who went to a different department. That didn't answer the Councilor Mayo, does that answer your question? Uh, is he on paid leave? Yes, he's on paid leave. Is he being paid by the city of Greenfield? He would be, yes, when they're on paid leave, I think they're still on the Greenfield um, payroll. Uh, uh, so then my question is, if we zeroed out that salary, how is he on paid leave? Can I? I yeah, think I can, I can answer this. You did not, you cut, you made a cut of $400,000 or give or take 425, somewhere in that neighborhood to the salary and wages line item. What you thought was a cut in the police chief and one other, uh, a lieutenant uh, salary is not what can happen or would happen. Uh, regardless of police chief Haig's status at the moment, he is still the police chief of the city of Greenfield. And there is a line item in salary and wages that pays for that. Um, and the same is true, I believe, for Lieutenant McCarthy, who was singled out for uh, reasons that uh, have already been stated. But it, either way, that those two positions remain in the budget. What you Despite them being happened, gone. what happened is a contract that this city council approved for the patrol officers states that in the need when we need to do layoffs, it is last hired, first fired, and we sorry about the language, but that is just the way it is. Um, and that is a uh, a contract that the city of Greenfield will honor. Mayor, don't you have the right to fire at will the police chief? I most certainly do not. Even he's under contract he's and he is a civil service police chief. So he's in essence under two, rule, two sets of rules. Okay, next I have um, Councilor Lachansky. Um, so I, I just want to clarify, I, I have a question for the mayor, but I also want to just clarify something for the public, because there's been a lot of uh, 
confusion. The city council does not have the authority to cut the salary of or fire individual police officers. We only have the authority to cut the total salaries, and then it's up to the mayor and the acting chief to decide how those cuts are distributed. I believe that the intent of the question of Councillor Mayo, because I couldn't quite hear him, was to ask why the expectation of officers being cut from the force has not happened. I don't think we got an answer to that, so I'd like to pose it again. We were expecting seven or eight officers to be cut. That hasn't happened. Where'd you get the money for that? So if I, I can actually take this one for right now, because we're going to get more of a robust update in August, because right now there's trying to work out how they're going to move forward. And that information is not all available right now. So Acting Chief Gordon is gonna have a more detailed presentation for us then. Okay, that's fine. And then one other thing, uh, in May, I can't remember which of you, but one of you stated very clearly that the mayor does have the authority to terminate the highest ranking officers of the police department because they are not under union contract. You're now contradicting that statement. What's the difference? I doubt very seriously if that statement, as you just uh, expressed it, was said. They operate under a separate contract, and you have you cannot fire at will. Words matter. These are legal terms. We are not authorized to fire at will. We have to fire for good cause at a minimum. And then he is also under a civil ser he is a civil service officer. And there are additional rules for that. And at this point in time, uh, we are not exercising the option because we don't have the information that we need that would cause us to have to fire uh, the police chief. And that is absolutely false. That is not false. And I uh, do not accept that characterization. I happen to know the job. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Lopiansky. Okay, I'm gonna move to Councillor Bullock now. I just wanted to clarify that Councillor Lopiansky used a collective we multiple times in his statement. And um, I think there was many reasons why the council did what they did in, in the entire budget budgeting process, not just with the police department. And um, I can speak personally that my intent was for the police department to look more carefully at their budget where things were potentially out of line um, in overtime and other things that were in those salary lines. And Officer Gordon did do a presentation to the Public Safety Committee where he went over his budget and gave rationale for what, what is happening at the moment. So I just wanted to say, there was a collective we used, and I think we as a council had very men, many different reasons for making the choices we did. Is there anyone else who had a question for the mayor or acting chief Gordon since he's up now? Yes, Councilor Desorger. I have a question for the mayor and, and not, this is not to do with the police, but I, I just thought of this afterwards. Um, this is about IT. Um, I, I looked in our budget and there is something uh, if, and I can't, I don't have the book in front of me, but there's something in the budget that had to do with like overtime or whatever. I think it's a $7,000 figure. Um, I was just wondering and no commitment now or anything, just throwing this out there. Do you think, would it be possible maybe for the next like say two meetings I know that Fernando was here last month and certainly everybody deserves a great vacation from all of this um, and no, uh, nothing, you know, towards that, but possibly for the next two meetings or something like that, might it be possible where we've had issues, uh, which that doesn't sound like it's, I don't, not assigning blame, but do you think that that might be possible to have somebody come from IT till we sort of in, get this interfacing straightened out? It's just 
would that be within the realm of possibility? That's all. Well, I don't, um, it's up to President Gilmore to determine what the agenda is for the council and who appears and she's heard your request, but I'm not quite sure what I understand. If I understand so that I can prepare um, Director Fernando, uh, Director Flurry, um, Fernando. <laughs> Are you asking about overtime in his budget or no, I'm, overtime? I'm asking if we could have some extra assistance oh, with IT okay. from here. because we've yeah, had some yeah. problems with um, uh, problems with IT for the past you know two months. We're just starting. We're just talking about the, the conversion to hybrid. It. Pardon me. You're talking about the conversion to hybrid. That's right. Okay. Um, and so you would like someone here at the council to assist on a regular basis versus us having to text them to say here, there, and every, uh, please come and assist. Right, for a couple uh, months, you know, maybe till we work this yeah. out. It's just, I just wanted to ask that because it occurred to me yeah. sitting here. Uh, I'll certainly talk to him about it. Um, I don't know what's in his budget to cover that kind of thing off the top of my head. So I'll, I'm happy to ask him that. Um, I will say this. It's an interesting thing that you bring up. I was at a mayor's meeting this week. And as you know, the legislature went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, wanting to make hybrid mandatory. And um, the MMA, the Mass Ma uh, Municipal Association is very much opposed to the mandatory piece of it because we see the difficulties. So for the city of Greenfield, by hook and by crook, um, some money from mayors unrestricted, I was able to make sure that you had the ability to have hybrid. But the, as you can see, it's very difficult and the technology is very difficult. So um, this is by way of explanation that the legislature was attempting to put forward something that they really didn't understand what the impact would be on all communities, especially smaller communities that don't have IT staffs or the financial wherewithal. And it was clearly an unfunded mandate. So that didn't go forward. But, um, but so they did extend the remote option. And uh, I think it's up to this council to decide if we want to um, have in-person and remote or hybrid, or if you want to go back to just remote. Uh, but that's your decision to make. Um, I personally like in-person meetings. Um, I prefer them. I think the people need to be able to see that the council is is working. I mean, there's I have there's good and bad to both. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've had several. We've had good experience with uh, the remote meetings. But I will, if you choose to go stick with the hybrid, be in person. And we'll work through these issues, and I, I will see if we can if we can fund that uh, through his budget. So, thank you very much. So I have Vice President Gwen next, and then I think uh, Clerk Scott is trying to get our attention on Zoom. So I'll recognize Clerk Scott right after Vice President Gwen. I I was just going to build off what Councillor Sorger um, brought up because she's nicer than I am. I think we're basically we need someone here for the next couple of meetings so yeah. this doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, um, whether the money comes from his budget or we have to allocate money, I don't think that's the question. Yeah. We need to get counselors heard and us heard. If we're going to offer this, we got to get it right. So whatever it takes to get someone from IT sitting here for the next couple of meetings, we just need to get that done. And I'm willing to work with anyone in any direction, but that's really what we need. And I'll remind you that it turns out that this was a GCTV issue tonight, not a tech issue, and it was handled. Okay. So um, remotely, apparently. <laughs> so I haven't seen Gene, and I haven't seen, uh, well, Fernando's wherever if, he is on his vacation. If we could just have one, someone to yeah. troubleshoot for a couple of sure. meetings and be, you know, um, the delays and the changes, I mean, those, I work with IT people every day of my life and engineers that know a lot more than I do. And I go, we have a problem and they come in and they fix it and the station stays on the air. Um, so that's what we need at this moment in time is, and it doesn't have to be forever, but for a couple of meetings, I think it could be helpful and not put stress on the clerk and everything else trying to figure out. And then once we're on a roll, I think we'll have it. But right now we, we definitely don't, but thank you for 
work, working on it remotely to get it done, but it would be nice to have maybe someone just to back us up for a couple of meetings. Clerk Scott, I know you have strong opinions on this one. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, welcome from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, University of Portsmouth. I am in training this week. Uh, I did want to let you know that we, on Friday, we tested this. Um, mm -hmm. IT was there, Tammy was there, I was on the other end. It went swimmingly. So uh, we were proactive. Um, there, there is a glitch. I heard the mayor say that it's some sort of technology with GCTV. If this happens again next month, we can't always fix the technology problem on the spot. Um, IT has been working on this on their end. They're not able to do anything for this meeting. Uh, I, I understand it's frustrating. It's frustrating for everyone. Tammy has been a rock star tonight trying to organize this all there. You know, um, it's frustrating all the way around. And I know, you know, we're all doing the best we can. Uh, I do, I did just want to let you know that we, we did try to test it out to make sure everything was going to be okay. Um, and I just wanted to let you all know that. <clears throat> yes, Councillor Elmer. Yeah, I, I think we probably should. Oh, is your mic on? We should probably let Kathy know that her face has been on the screen this whole time. <laughs> and uh, that, she, that she might want to turn her turn her camera off when she's not speaking to us. Thanks. Don't worry, you didn't do anything embarrassing. I'm <laughs> I'm actually I if it's okay with everybody, I'm out. gonna go to class. Um and I will see you all next week. Enjoy. Oh, thank you. Okay. Did anyone else? Yes, Councillor Toronto. Um, to go like way back full circle, um, uh, to kind of retouch on the, um, the health department thing. I, uh, I just want to make clear, I don't, I don't, I certainly don't think that it's not a benefit to the city. I recognize that, um, this is a great honor for us to be considered a lead municipality for our community. And we should be because we are the county seat in many ways and pretty much always, um, my only, my only, and this, this will probably come more from uh, having Director Hoffman here or more information after, as you said, it's very fresh, it's very new that we haven't even seen it yet. Um, I was just uh, wanting to ensure that the cost benefit made sense, that I, I'm very much for mutual aid in all aspects of our smaller communities because obviously they need it. And all of these small towns can't stand on their own. And that's why we have, you know, some sort of regionalization. Um, it's, I look at it as akin to uh, being, being a, a good employee at a place. And then because you're a good employee, everyone keeps piling on more responsibility to you and yeah. then the burden is just on your shoulders all the time to take it so if we my that was why my my concern was how is this um is the money that's being uh delegated out to these certain places making sense with the amount of uh labor involved and that that was really my concern is the breakdown of it i understood i understood yeah. what you were looking for okay. counselor <laughs> um i i guess the only thing I would say uh, in response is, I think this is a result of the fact that COVID laid bare the um, in inequalities in uh, our communities and what kind of resources have been made available to our smaller communities by the state, but particularly in Western Massachusetts, but I think all over the state um, to, um, Actually, um, Director Hoffman may be getting on the meeting. Um, I think that's what that just said. Um, so, um, it, but it laid bare what that is. And I think this is the Department of Public Health understanding that 
and if nothing else, preparing to go forward. And by doing that, it's to increase the ability of this. I mean, we worked with, as you know, during, during COVID, um, all the communities in Franklin County, and we were sort of the lead uh, on that. Um, and they looked to us as much as possible. So um, I think I think this is uh, Director Hoffman. If you, Jennifer, if if that Earth to Jennifer, if that's you, if you want, I to, am here. Uh, explain at least in brief uh, what this grant is for and about, uh, and to help the counselors understand how we can benefit and so forth. Good evening, Council, and uh, I'm sorry for my late arrival. Uh, the grant we were just awarded is uh, a grant from the Office of Local uh, Public Health and the Department of Public Health. And it is a $300,000 grant a year for the next five years. We um, actually uh, participated in this grant because it is to help get uh, local pub public health up to standards um, across the state. Public health, as everyone knows, has been uh, underfunded for a very long time. And this is money um, that is trying to help multiple communities together on a regional level. We currently have the COVID-19 contact tracing grant where we work with Montague, Deerfield, and Sunderland. And that has been a great collaboration. And um, now we are gonna be working with uh, Montague, Deerfield, Sunderland, Shutesbury, and Leverett um, to expand not just, um, we are basically going to be getting more help that is much needed in each of our communities, not just Shutesbury and Leverett. It is all the communities that are involved in the grant. Um, and it's, like I said, spanned out through five years. Um, and that's going to be where we have updated computers, printers, software, staffing, and then we have to make sure that everybody is academically up to par, meaning everyone's licensed um, in um, areas such as Title V, uh, Certified Pool Operator, Food Services, um, and people that are in directorship positions such as myself would have to become registered sanitarians if they don't have their master's degree, uh, but it would be helpful. So it's basically trying to make a standard across the Commonwealth um, and um, making everything somewhat equal across the board, not where just public health services is to the east side of the Commonwealth, that Western Mass will get much needed help that it needs and has been underserved. And just so you know, myself and the communities that we're collaborating with are very excited about this grant because um, we could all work together and basically have similar public health initiatives, especially since um, many of um, people travel throughout these local communities and we should be speaking the same thing and not different things. We should all be on same board with initiatives and um, and that's what we're really excited to do. Thank you. Are there any council? Yes, Councilor Taranzo. <clears throat> uh, thank you for answering the question. I, as a follow-up, you said this is a three hundred thousand per year for five years. Is that correct? Correct. And if okay. there's still funding federal dollars that come to the Commonwealth, it can get extended up to another four years. Okay. However, and, right okay, now they're trying to get us. Um, they're going to be looking at our standards to see when we write up our quarterly reports, are we meeting the standards? And basically um, what additional help we need? Um, what trainings does do, every, do different towns need to get up to par so we can service our communities appropriately? And so are, you said something about there might be extra staffing. Are you anticipating being able to add staff uh, for the next, as you say, five years, maybe even to nine years if it continues. And what would that look like? Would that be a full-time, part-time? It have would a, depend have any... on the needs of um, each community. If I'm speaking of Greenfield, I could say, yes, uh, we are going to need assistance. I have a part-time nurse right now that works for the city. Um, 
the two contact tracers, uh, contact tracers that we have that work for Montague, Sunderland and Deerfield, they are just grant funded for 19 hours a week. Uh, Megan Tudrin currently works just 20 hours a week. Um, so I would need a, a town, a city our size uh, should have a full-time and a part-time nurse. We should have um, more staffing. We should have a secretary um, at least to help us with clerical duties. Um, and if we are gonna be more certified in other things uh, like goals to be uh, lead inspectors, um, as an example, we would need help if we're gonna be moving on to uh, things that come up. I'm, I mean, I'm not saying this is happening, but for example, pre-rental inspections, um, we would need the help to do that. It can't be just uh, two inspectors doing housing and food safety and uh, you know pool operators and recreational camps, plus the multiple complaints we get a day. So we would definitely need help in Greenfield, um, especially because we serve a larger population. And the same would go for Montague, Deerfield, Sunderland, Shootsbury, and Leverett. Okay, thanks. Is there any more? Okay, Councilor Lapiansky. Yeah, so um, uh, one, I just want to comment on a couple of things that have come up. So uh, with regard to the, the thing about how much can so many people in the health department do, I just want to note that it really is up to us as a city to decide how much we want the health department to do. So if we're going to ask them to do more, obviously we should pay them better and give them more staff. We could also decide that there are some things that could be done by someone else or that we don't need to be done. We do have those options. Um, and with regard to the hybrid meetings, I wanna point out that this is a burden we have placed upon ourselves. We don't have to do hybrid meetings. We could just show up in a room like we've done for the last 250 years. And instead we've decided voluntarily to be held hostage by this fear of germs that's hysterical on par with the fear of Muslims after 9-11, and I'm kind of tired of it. Point of order. Yes. Yes, Councilor Armour. Uh, not relevant. Thank you. All right, did, did any other councilors have questions uh, for Director Hoffman while she's on the line? Councilor Bullock. Was there anyone for Councilor, or sorry, for Director Hoffman before I, so I can let her go? This isn't a question. I just want to say thank you. That's it. Public health has been really underfunded, and I'm grateful that you've worked on this this grant and that this is happening. Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Bullock. Um, and did I see another hand? Okay, Councillor Bullock. Um, I just wanted to ask Mayor if you had time. We received an email. Um, a couple days ago from an organization in Amherst called Generation Ratify. Um, and they actually did, uh, they identified as a, a local intersectional youth led movement working for gender equality. Um, and they did a free audit for us um, of pay scales in Greenfield. And I was wondering if you had time to look at that yet. I saw the email come through. Uh, I have not had an opportunity to read through the entire email or, and I think there might've been an attachment. Yeah. Um, I haven't had an opportunity to do that today. It, I only received it today. Oh, okay. Um, so I haven't had an opportunity to do it, but I will, I will tell the city councilors who may not know this, um, we did undertake a pay equity study. Um, three, it was before I got here, but the results came in in 2020. And, um, and actually, we fared pretty well in the pay equity study, but it was it was not an overall pay scale study for the city of Greenfield. It had more to do with um, gender equity mm -hmm. than it did um, uh, it did with the, you know, uh, what, how does the city of Greenfield fare in paying its employees? Um, so uh, they found uh, two instances out of the more than 100 people that we do employ um, where we needed to bring uh, those particular staff people up to um, up to the level that they should be. 
um, and we took care of that in the FY 20 budget, 21 budget, if I'm not mistaken. That's great. I'm really but glad. I, I, I understand. I think I had a gist of what, what it was about, and I'm happy to read it and, uh, and respond to them. Yeah, I'm really glad that we did a compensation study as a as a city, and I think that um, I'm really glad that these youth did this study for us. Um, and they they did have some statistical findings that were that that we do have a gender pay gap in Greenfield, um, and it's it, it's just pretty interesting. So I would urge other council members, um, if you haven't, to read um, through. They they specifically did look at. Uh, departments like schools and DPW that statistically hire more women um, that they have we have a smaller wage gap in Greenfield uh, versus uh, police and fire departments which statistically hire more men have a much larger wage gap um, in our city so I'm just grateful that this group uh, did this for us for free and that there's some somewhere for us to start with this. Are there any other councillors who have questions for the mayor? It looks like Councillor Mayo's hand was up. No, he put it back down. Okay, that must have been from earlier. All right, thank you. Would point out that um, Director Torog is still on the meeting, so I don't know if people have other questions on the tier thing. But um, were there any questions for to Director Torog? No, I think we're good for now. Thank you. Uh, just a question: Will he share? Sure, he would be. I'm. Sure, will he be on later when we discuss that topic? I I kind of doubt it. Yes. Um, That's too bad. But I'm happy. I'm sure if you keep track of the questions, he'll be happy to answer them for you. If I you do have, know you have to take a vote. If you have a question now. No, no I Olivia. don't. But I just might have one in the course of that debate, I which see. is not the one we're having now. Yeah, I see. Um, it's unfortunate, but. I don't know that he's going to be able to attend all night. Okay. <clears throat> next in, yes, thank you. Um, next, I have public comment. And the first person I have who signed up is Al Collins. So if you could state your name and your address for the record. And then everyone's going to, we don't have a lot of people, so everyone's going to get the full three minutes tonight. Like better. Okay. All right. Name is Al Collins. I live at 527 Country Club Road. And I've reached out to each and every one of you over the past six months or so and uh, about the concerns over the problems with large outdoor cannabis cultivations. And I want to thank each one of you for expressing your support and to us directly on this. Uh, it's a community wide issue. But because I will not be allowed to speak during the uh, deliberations, if I may clarify a few points. And one, uh, we are, you're fine with a no vote tonight on a moratorium, but we don't need it. Your EDC and planning board both have voted no on the moratorium. And if you pass the tier limits language tonight, there will be plenty of time for you to, um, to uh, address the further zoning issues that are going to be needed without having to pause development and because the large loophole on the grows will have been uh, closed so number two any applicant or someone with a grow elsewhere in the city already who applies for a special permit for an expanded outdoor growth will have to will be in conformance with these limits per parcel which are more generous than what were what the council passed back in 2018 and uh three if uh you're not changing the use of the land in the rural residential zone you're just reimposing the size limit so the proposal for country club road which has still not been uh, submitted to the city was uh, like 60 times larger than, than uh, the limit you voted in in support of uh, in March of 2018. 
So you all know that there has been a tremendous amount of support and effort put into this by you and your constituents. I'd like to ask everybody in this room who supports the size limit language to stand up now and give the council a round of applause for their cooperation. <laughs> All right, folks, your time is up. I love it when you guys applaud us, yeah, but no. <laughs> Okay, next I have Jesus Leva, please. Hi. Um, so I, I actually sent my comments to everybody by email, so I'm not gonna, oh, great. Uh, my name is Jesus Leva, uh, 32 High Street, uh, Greenfield. Um, I sent my comments by email, so I'm not just going to read them all off. I just want to focus on a very specific portion of it. Um, I'd like to thank the mayor for um, recognizing that um, there is a need to address um, reform issues concerning the police department. So calling for an audit is a way to do that and recognizes that need. Um, but I wonder if it will actually serve that intended purpose. I, I, I think as we saw from the last city council meeting and all the people who spoke, that the verdict itself was very polarizing for the community. And I, I don't think that an audit coming to any conclusion is going to really change that. I, I'd like to suggest that if city council or the mayor is inclined to spend money for outside consultation concerning the police, that they may be focused on two very specific things, which is um, maybe making a needs determination about how many police officers the city should have and for consultation on um, alternatives to policing. I think um, citizens and even the police department agree, there's probably a lot of calls that go to the police department that the police department should not have to deal with. They're not really part of the core mission of the police department, but they do demand some kind of an institutionalized community response. So, um, you know, I, I, I think we, you know, we get someone to do a feasibility study to see how we can implement an alternative policing um, system for, for those specific calls. Um, I'd also just like to say that I support the idea of a of a of, of a citizen task force to look over police reform. I, I I think that it it needs there needs to be some kind of citizen participation in that reform process. I I don't think it can just be someone from outside of the community making determinations about how. Um, what what we think might need to change at the police department. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Jonathan McGee. Name and address, please. John McGee, Green Street. Um, Hello, counselors. Thank you all for, as always, for your service and hard work. Could you bring the microphone a little closer, please? Yes. Uh, hello, counselors. Thank you, as always, for your service and hard work. Um, I believe that Ways and Means tabled uh, the mayor's request last night, uh, her request for a police audit until next month's meeting. Um, and thank you, Ways and Means, for doing that. Um, I've spoken with many people in town who agree that it really matters how we approach this process. And we don't want to rush into something, especially if we haven't ironed out guidelines for community oversight of an audit. Um, I also gather from Councillor Bullock that she's proposing a community-led process to re-envision public safety. Um, and I think that's something we need to do. I think many of you probably agree. Uh, I would say that we have to consider not just what the police do, but what they shouldn't do, and who else could do a better job meeting community needs um, I think a process like that 
can still highlight things that our police does well. Um, but we have to look at, you know, not just police policies and procedures, but also like start from our needs. Um, when we have our need, when we can, you know, look at our needs as a community, we can look at the evidence of what works best and build our community's capacity to meet those needs appropriately. Um, please let's also take some of the next month uh, to look at lessons learned from other community processes. Um, we wanna help a diverse selection of people to participate in a meaningful way. And we wanna set ourselves up to make good evidence-based policy decisions. Uh, so again, thank you for not rushing into a process. Thank you. Next, I have Pamela Goodwin. Good evening, counselors. I live at 54 High Street, apartment 307. Um, I want to thank you for your hard work, and I especially want to thank Councillor Bullock for her comment. I attended the Public Safety Committee. I learned a great deal about what the acting chief needs to do, plans to do, who's resigned, who's quit, who's going to retire early. And I found that particular committee extremely astute. I was very glad I went to it. I understand, and I didn't go to Ways and Means, but I think from the public's viewpoint, and even from some counselors, we're entitled to be, kind of be filled in. We can't all go to all these committees, and I'm pretty sure you're not able to go to all the committees. So at the very least, I think we just need to have a quick summary from somebody. And so um, I gave you my summary, and I really appreciate Councillor Bullock, um, because something as critical as this, defunding the police or whatever you want to call it, is um, it's all over Facebook. My sheriff friend who's on my state board called and asked me what is going on in Greenfield. So I really appreciate the hard work that the acting chief is doing. And I understand fully that we're going to be working quarterly and that he plans to present something next month. Secondly, I recently heard that most, um, several or all of the Human Rights Commission have resigned. That concerns me. And I don't know the numbers. I really loved the gentleman who gave the talk last month. I thought it was beautiful and needed. And I would love to know how person gets on that committee because I believe it's a mayoral appointment. And I would also like to say that I would like to see that it would be people of color people from different backgrounds, and that there would be a wide variety that would represent the city of Greenfield. Um, I also thought we were going to have a citizens uh, group with some kind of input. To give a two or a three minute comment is just not enough. And I do call the president often, I call other counselors, but I think that it's really important to have a venue for people to get involved with the government from all angles. Um, and I'll even say that either two months ago, because we had these meetings going until midnight and we had a second night, somebody, and I don't know who, said, well, we wouldn't have to sit here till midnight if we didn't have two straight hours of public comment. I was gravely offended by that because to have to go from three minute to two minute was bad enough. You know, a big agenda is a big agenda. You guys have a huge task. And I thank you for all your hard work. And I'd love to know where the porta potty went because I guess I'm gonna call the Board of Health. I can't find it. And if thank you, that's time. Next, I have Carolyn Bruno. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Um, my name is Caroline Bruno and I live at 92 Peabody Lane in Greenfield. Um, I want to thank all the counselors for continuing to be involved and bring forward a lot of really good ideas in relation to how we can look at our police department in the wake of the Buchanan verdict. 
Um, and I'm grateful for continued engagement with thinking about a um, audit process that the mayor is proposing. Um, I'm also grateful for tabling that um, because of the kind of blunt object, which is the, the council's role in this, which is to merely decide if we will spend this much money on something. Um, and that's a challenging space to be in. Um, I understand the, the option is limited by what the mayor proposes and the amendments are limited to how that can be um, carried forward. Um, so I'm in support of reducing greatly the, the amount of money going towards an independent audit and instead committing a significant amount of money funding from what may have been proposed tonight and will be tabled for next week, next month to a citizen review um, task force. That gives us an opportunity to look at public safety so much more broadly and one where it brings together, as Jesus mentioned, um, co community trust around what we actually need. A lot of mistrust built from um, the Buchanan verdict and a lot of misconduct that was brought forward won't be addressed by a continued um, sort of individualized process. Um, but a key feature of the independent audit that um, could be supported through this as well is having independence from the police department. Um, we all know that when some misconduct is, is brought forward that having external review is necessary. Um, so part of that, any process that might be amended or addressed for next month, having um, no police officers present as voting members on that policy, um, on that task force would feel important to maintain the external accountability of that feature. Um, and I think the last thing that I wanted to bring forward tonight is that a key feature of reducing the police budget um, by $425,000 was to bring it in line with other cities of our size. And the 175,000 for the audit is outsized for that type of intervention. Um, and yeah, is drastically higher than some of the other options that have been put forward at like $78,000. So thank you. Thank you. All right, that's the last person I had for a public comment. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the public hearing. <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry. I do have someone. I have and Glenn Ayers, um, who wants to speak to us via Zoom. I didn't know sorry, if that was that. possible. So thank you for the opportunity, uh, Council. My name is Glenn Ayers. I live at 254 Davis Street. And I just wanted to update the community. I can turn my video on for you. I just wanted to update the community on the situation at Lunt, the cleanup at um, Lunt, former Lunt silversmiths, and the result of the audit that happened where uh, DEP found that the city was in violation of the regulations requiring the cleanup of that contaminated site. And a response to the audit report is due at the end of July. And that response will be subject to a full review by the public involvement plan group, which currently has 111 members that have signed on to that, what's referred to as the PIP, the public involvement plan process. And we will do a complete review of that submission, but that submission is being presented to DEP by the LSP, the licensed site professional, who caused all of the violations that the audit found. And that LSP currently works for and is paid by the real estate developer lawyer who is renting the Lunt property and has developed it, prematurely developed it. And it, it's the same LSP that the city council just voted no confidence in at your previous meeting, and which the community has no confidence in. But that's the situation. It's like a Kafka-esque situation that we are in, where the same person responsible for the violations gets to submit even more information that no one has confidence in. But we will review it. 
and we will provide comments on it. And hopefully um, this situation will at some point be clarified because the Board of Health Chair in Greenfield, Nancy Bershoff, just resigned at the last Board of Health meeting. And a few months ago, uh, Dr. Bershoff had to apologize to the entire community because she was given inadequate information about the Lunt situation and had to, it really had to eat crow in public. And I think that was very difficult for her. I don't know if that contributed to her uh, early resignation from the position of the chair, but I'm very concerned that we do not support the Board of Health and provide them with expert technical assistance that they need, especially with dealing with the Lunt situation, which is a highly complex, highly technical contamination problem. And so I hope that this community will support the Board of Health and hire an independent LSP that will represent the interests of the community the residents that are being contaminated by the Lunt pollution, and also to um, to get a second opinion. All right, on thank you. The well, information. Yes, thank you very much. That's the end of your time. Thank you very much. Was there anybody else who's logged into Zoom who wants to speak during public comment? Okay, it doesn't look like there's anyone else. Okay. Okay, next on our agenda, we have um, public hearing and second readings. Um, so, yes. Point of order, if I may, um, the public hearing is on the 175 uh, that was requested from the mayor to fund the assessment and audit of the Greenfield Police Department. Ways and Means at last night's meeting tabled a decision on that. Um, does that impact the public hearing going forward at this time? I think the fact that we have a public hearing posted means we need to hold the hearing. I don't think it means we need to vote on the issue per se, since we don't have a you know, recommendation from Ways and Means. And we did have one person sign up for the public hearing. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. So we'll open up the public hearing at 814 and I have Jesus Leva. Um, did you want to, I'm sorry, we have to have the second reading. And then we have someone who wants to speak during the hearing. So are we doing are we doing public hearing first or um, second reading? You, you read both of them at the same time. So you read public reading, everything on the page. Public okay. reading and then the second. Thank you very much. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Public hearing in accordance with Home Rule Charter, the Greenfield City Council will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, July 20, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. at Johnson Community Center, 35 Pleasant Street and Zoom remote access gives the address to receive public input on the following. Appropriate $175,000 from Fund 8400, general stabilization for independent assessment and audit of the city of Greenfield's police department structure policies and practices. The city council may consider the same on Wednesday, July 20th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. at Johnson Community Center, 35 Pleasant Street and Zoom remote access address follows. Materials can be obtained from the city clerk's office, 14 Court Square, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday, or phone 413-772-1555, extension 6163. Sheila Gilmore, City Council President. Thank you. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then I had um, Jesus, Jesus Le I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. We also have to read the part at the bottom, the appropriate 175. 
City Council second yes. reading, July 20, 2022, appropriate 175,000 from fund 8400, general stabilization for independent assessment audit of the city of Greenfield's police department structure policies and practices. Thank you. And with no further ado, we have Jesus Leva. I, I think I said most of what I wanted to say at public comment, but um, I guess I did want to say that um, there, Mary Ann, you had proposed a task force at some point. That's something that the um, city council will be discussing in the future. And I, I think that um, within the context of the audit that, um, if we're going to spend money on an independent analysis that maybe some those expenditures should be reviewed by a task force or a group of citizens um, to, to look at what it is that we want to consult with outside um, experts on. I mean, I, I, I think citizens have some idea of what their concerns are. Um, that's, I guess that's all I'm trying to say. And I, I guess, I, again, I'd like to reiterate that I think two things that we could definitely consult for are um, making a determination based on data about how many police officers, a community of this size with as many calls as it gets, being the county seat and all of those other details is. I, I don't think that we should guess at the idea of how many police officers we need. I don't think it should be feelings-based um, I, I think we should actually use information to figure that out. Um, and then I think there are other communities that have already implemented alternative policing models where they have a separate department that deals with specific um, emergency calls that are not of a police nature. So um, we should consult for those with some outside sources. That's, that's all, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody attending online who wants to speak at a public hearing? It doesn't look like it. All right. So I'm going to close the public hearing at 819. And since we've been here for two hours now, I'm also going to ask for a five minute recess before we move into motions, orders, and resolutions. So take five. We'll be back in five minutes. We are on motions, orders, and resolutions. Um, so first we have the um, invoice from Siemens Inc. Councillor Forgy, if you're, when you're ready, if you could read that for us. Uh, it's order number fiscal year 22141. The city council upon recommendation of Mayor Weta Gardner in order to approve payment of a, of a prior year invoice in the amount of $10,814 ordered that. The Greenfield City Council approved the payment of prior year invoices for Siemens Inc. in the amount of $10,814 to be paid from the fiscal year 22 Energy Department budget. A nine tenths yes vote is required to make this uh, pass. It is a prior year bill. Uh, it came out of committee with a positive unanimous recommendation. However, it's been delayed because we didn't have enough people present at prior meetings to get our nine tenths vote to make this pass. Second. Second, Ricketts. Great. Do we have any discussion? Yes. Um, I'm just curious what happens if this doesn't pass? It will. It's against law. I don't, Councillor Forgy, could mm. you tell us? I, I don't think we've ever gone through that. We didn't. But right. In theory, the, um, the, I guess uh, you would need a better financial brain than mine right at the moment. But you to. I've never had a situation where it, a prior year. Ask two questions. You want to listen to this or not? No, I want you to mute this so I could hear what you're saying. At home, if you could There's, please mute. Listen. We're trying to get through our first order motion. 
Okay, thank good. you. We okay. could, okay, so I've never seen one that does not pass. It is owed and um, it's, it's legal for us to go ahead and allocate for a prior year bill, given the majority vote that it takes. If it doesn't pass, I don't have an answer for that uh, at this point. I think that would be a Liz question. It might even, I have no clue, it might even have to be raised on the tax rate or something like that. Because DOR would step in for an issue like this. Yeah, I imagine they're, they're gonna need to get their money. They're gonna, they're gonna want it paid, yeah. yeah. Councillor Mayo has his hand up. Yes, Councillor Mayo. Is he unmuted? Yeah, he's he's in mm -hmm. the There you go. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just was interested in uh, what uh, what the services what that was paid for for by Siemens or what the. What kind of services did they render to to the town? What what I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear the hear. question. He was, he was asking what the what the service was rendered to the town. Oh uh, well, there's a memo that was attached to this paperwork, and it was. Um, let me just see here. Yeah, it was an agreement piece. It was related to guaranteed savings from energy efficiency upgrades performed. By uh, Simons to Siemens to the town buildings, the city of Greenfield is contractually obligated for 20 years to pay for a performance assurance report. The invoice wasn't sent until well into 2021, and the report was also late in arriving, and it took some time to sort out all of the invoices and reports since they were getting sent to different municipal staff at all times of the year combined with a high rate of turnover at Siemens resulted in highly confusing and missing delayed invoices and report uh, reports. The energy department has created a schedule for the invoices, payments, and receipt of reports in order to avoid future problems with this account. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, this passes. Great. Um, um, next one? Yes, please. Okay. Um, order number fiscal year 22-155, the City Council upon recommendation of Mayor Weta Gardner ordered that the sum of $175,000 be appropriated from fund 84 100 general stabilization to fund an independent assessment and audit of the city of Greenfield's police department's structures, policies, and practices. Areas to be in, excuse me, areas to be covered include, but not limited to the following organization structure and governance, organizational structure and governance, operating policies and procedures, department culture, hiring and promotional practices, professional standards and accountability, budgeting and planning, two thirds majority vote, which is nine. Current general stabilization balance, $2,153,843.45. Do I have a second? <clears throat> okay, there's no second. Second. Okay. Second by Lapiansky. All right. Um, would you like to report out from? I, I can report out from uh, Ways and Means Committee meeting last night. The committee decided that we needed to table this. We have to have more discussion. And we uh, also heard last night the presentation from Councillor Bullock in regard to uh, community based uh, assessment plan as well. Um, I, be I believe, I don't want to misquote um, Councillor Bullock, but I know that she has had a discussion with the mayor about this and we seem to be proceeding. So we feel pretty comfortable that there might be another financial offer or order, excuse me, coming forward for in time for our August meeting as well. Um, 
So we did table mm -hmm. and we will take it from the table in August. And I think that my personal recommendation on this is that we table this as well. Mm -hmm. um, Councillor Bullock, did you want to expand on that before we look for a motion? Yeah, just um, so everyone is on the council and the public is on the same page. Um, there is a is a process that's been unfolding um, since the, the last month's meeting uh, and the and the audit being recommended uh, to form a city community led task force to reimagine public safety. Um, and so this task force would meet regularly through the duration of the audit. Um, it would provide some oversight to the audit to make sure that um, there's community specific guardrails uh, because these are outside auditors um, and then work more long term through a community engagement process to define um, a new vision for public safety. And I think some of what uh, Director Hoffman spoke about today um, and some of the other things we've heard about how some of our public safety in infrastructure has not been adequately invested in. This will be a holistic look at, um, at public safety. And so I did, I was able to speak with the mayor about this um, twice and I spoke with her today and she has agreed to um, send a new fiscal order, one for up to $100,000 for uh, a audit and one, an, one and in the, maybe in the same one or another one for 75,000 um, for a community led task force. Thank you, Councilor Lapiansky. Um, so that sounds like a great idea. I am lost as to our timeline because that's not on our agenda tonight. So are we discussing both of these in August? Is that the intention? So um, I think, and I can't speak for anyone, but I think that you know I'm gonna be looking for a motion to table this for tonight. And we're going to, you know, from, from what I understand, this financial order is going to be rescinded and then a new one is gonna be brought forward. Got it. So moved to table. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right, it's non-debatable. All in favor to table this motion. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Councilor Mayo, you were opposed? No, I, I meant to say, I said aye. I said aye. I, okay, I wasn't sure if that was a delay. I'm sorry, any abstentions? Okay, great. Next. Surplus property. Um, Councillor Elmer. Surplus property. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, there's two parts to this. Uh, pardon me. There are two parts to this. Uh, the first part is whether we declare it uh, surplus property. And then the second part is, do we let the mayor sell it? So um, I'm going to read the order. The first order, order number FY23001. Um, this, um, the, the city council moved that it be ordered that the Greenfield City Council declares real estate abutting, abutting 139 Harrison Avenue, a portion of parcel 124-53 to be surplus property and transfer said property to the mayor for sale. Majority vote required. Did I mess that up? Um, I'd second that. Thank you. Yes, not. Can I get a report from committee? Yeah, the committee gave this uh, a positive unanimous recommendation. If you look at the documents that are attached, this was a, a street that never got built uh, and uh, a little and is not going to get built, according to uh, uh, Director Torog. And uh, a family that has a house that abuts a piece of that property would like to buy it. Uh, the mayor thinks it's surplus uh, and the uh, and we went along with that. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. So um, I looked at the maps and uh, it seems to me, uh, first of all, of course, the roads are not going to get built. There's actually several in that neighborhood that are right of ways for roads that were at some point intended. They're obviously not going to get built. With that said, um, 
if we sell just this small portion of the property as indicated, uh, the rest of that right of way, as well as one or two other properties that are in the middle of that section will then uh, become parcels that do not have any access to any public way. And so I'm wondering why we don't just sell the whole right of way as one piece because the rest of it is no longer accessible or usable as a street or as anything else. Uh, if I could, I think the answer is that someone wanted this piece and is willing to pay money for it. Um, nobody else has come forward asking for other parts of that, those ghost streets. Um, so uh, I guess it doesn't make sense to give away something that nobody wants. Uh, anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the way it looked to us. Yes. If I recall correctly, I believe there were some wetland wetland impacts on that property as well that didn't make it very uh, attractive to anybody. That, that's the I think that's the if I could that I think that's the reason that the road is never going to get built is because there's wetlands. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Abstentions. Sorry, are you opposed? I'm, I'm, I abstain. Abstain, okay, thank you. Sorry, I moved too fast there, sorry. <clears throat> okay, having declared it uh, surplus property, then the, the second one follows, order number FY23002, uh, move that it be ordered that the Greenfield City Council authorizes the mayor to sell a portion of parcel 124-53 abutting 139 Harrison Avenue pursuant to the city council policy for the sale of city owned land and authorize the mayor to execute all documents necessary to accomplish the same majority vote required. And I can report that this got a unanimous positive Excellent. recommendation. Thank Second you. that too. Great. Any questions or comments? Okay, all in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Wonderful, it passes. Okay. Now page 253, special permit in section. Okay, this is also EDC. This is marijuana establishment section B. Sorry, uh, President Gilmore. Sorry. Two. I'm sorry. Did I skip ahead? Roman numeral four. Oh, see, I'm just excited, guys. <laughs> huh? All right. Amend zoning section 200 6.7 signs. Yeah. It's not as interesting. Uh, the page for that is 243. 243. Okay, let me back up. Okay. I want to try to keep this simple. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to read the order and then I'll explain. Uh, order number FY22-142, the City Council moved that it be ordered that the City Council of Greenfield amend the zoning ordinance chapter 200, section 200-6.7 sign regulations as indicated by attached exhibit A with strike through text to be deleted and bold text to be added and further amends the table of contents and index of the code and further that non-substantive -sub changes to the numbering of the ordinance be permitted Committed in order that it be in compliance with the numbering format of the code of the city of Greenfield, two thirds vote required. Do I have a second? Second. Mayo. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, there's an eight page document attached. Uh, this was, um, and I'm gonna just gonna, rather than read the whole thing and even read the strike throughs, it's available if you wanna read it, but let me, let me characterize it. This is, this was something put forward by uh, Director Torog uh, reacting to a study of the city uh, about the signage of the city and how uh, people would be better directed in the town. One of the uh, changes is to uh, eliminate the requirement that you get a, a, a license for each sign. Uh, as long as you follow the rules, uh, you don't have to go through the licensing board. One of the things uh, it allows is if you have a corner building that you can put a sign on either face. Uh, another thing is it allows sandwich boards. Uh, 
hopefully they won't block the street, but if they do, there's someone that's in charge of, uh, <laughs> Councilor Disorder is worried that, uh, that there would be, uh, these might impede people in, um, in wheelchairs. Um, and we'll just have to see if that happens. There are ways to enforce that if it does. Uh, and then um, the, I guess the, uh, the newest thing, the reason this got held up for a month, there's new language about electronic signs. Uh, if you want to know what these look like, there's a new one in front of GCC uh, that uh, tells you that you can get COVID tested flashes occasionally. Th that sign would violate this ordinance, but it doesn't apply because apparently that's state property. Um, I think that the, explicitly the thinking of the planning board that is that Greenfield doesn't want to have a lot of electronic flashing signs. Uh, we don't want to be like Las Vegas. Um, so, and not, not that we, well, we could use the money, but um, anyway, the, the, uh, this, uh, this went through a couple iterations uh, and it got a unanimous positive recommendation from the EDC. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, Council Borgi. I would just uh, like to say that this zone, these um, these zoning changes have no effect uh, on the language that exists right now for residential, semi-residential, and health districts. I just think that's important that we're we're not asking uh, they're not asking for any uh, any changes to residential. Sony. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I saw Vice President. Oh, sorry, Councilor Desorger, and then Vice President Quinn. Um, I'm going to vote in favor of this, but I just want to point out my concern um, was this: these are going to be on the sidewalks in the you know the commercial district, and I understood the rationale behind it. Um, Every time there was a sandwich board that was going to go out, they didn't want to have to go before the licensing board. It was a cost to the businesses. And we wanted to be friendly towards the businesses. Um, and I think that the signs actually do uh, garner business that comes in. But I want to point out that as we are uh, looking at staffing in one department, it should probably be done across the board because th there actually isn't enforcement. Um, there isn't enough staff, um, although we added, I think, a half person to building inspector. We have a uh, flashing sign in RA that um, it, there, there is not enforcement on many of the building issues. And this is no slight at all to Mark Snow and his group. I think they're doing a wonderful job with the staff that they have. But it's hard to pass these things. And we do have a lot of people with disabilities. I'm hoping that all of the businesses will responsibly place their signs. And um, I just think we have to make sure that our departments have enough help. Thank you. I, I want to build off what Councillor DeSorger said. Um, we have very structured sign ordinances in Greenfield for good reasons. Um, the, you know, you go to Maine, there's no billboards. There's a reason they don't have billboards. They don't want them. Um, we've always had a good sign. I'm in favor of this, so it, I'm not going to vote against this, but I, I think we need to keep those cautions. It's not anti-business to not allow signage to have regulation and make sure signage conforms, because when you don't, it just looks bad. And I would caution, as Councillor DeSorger said, with sandwich boards, you know, they're good if they're kept up to date and they're, they're rotated and they're moved and they're put in places. But I don't know who the sandwich board police are going to be, you know, who's going to, you know, regulate that. But it was, we used to have the problem. I remember uh, Mayor Forgey and, and I had the, the tag sale signage police while she was the mayor. <laughs> and it was the, it was the biggest thing because people have to take their tag sale signs down within so many moments of your tag sale and you have to take your political signs down within so many days of the election 
So I get a little worried that I don't know who's going to follow up on, on some of this, but I just hope that people take it upon themselves to make sure they self-regulate, make sure that we're, we're doing that. Now, it's also a little bit tough for anyone that's on the Mohawk Trail, which runs through town, because the state will just come and take your signs because they don't want them on the, on the trail as a former trail business owner. I only could put them out on weekends because they didn't work weekends. Um, and then after I'm getting them, bring them back because on Monday they throw them out. So, you know, we have regulations for a reason. I think this is good, but um, as long as we, we pay attention and, and not get into a situation where it, it just looks bad. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Lapiansky. Um, so I have a question first, and then I have a comment about specific language in here. My, my question is, uh, is it correct that all of this is enforced through, through the building department? Yes. I believe you have to go to a planning and zoning for a sign permit first, right? And then from there, you could get a building permit. They either go, I believe they either go through planning. I know planning gave one to the one in our neighborhood that I questioned, which is not legal. So uh, just to clarify, enforcement of violations, it falls exclusively under the building department? Right. So um, I don't know that that's within the scope of this discussion, but we maybe should revisit that because the building department can't even do the building job because Mark Snow's working by himself. And unless we double the amount of money he has in his salary line between now and whenever this happens, he's not. I, the answer is there will be no enforcement. You can do whatever you want because Mark is not capable of doing the amount of job we're asking him to do. And anyone who can be a building inspector can be a, can be a contractor and make eight times as much money. And so I just don't see how we're gonna hire building inspectors at the levels of money that we're paying them. Um, which is different than some other departments. Uh, my comment with regard to specific language has to do with uh, section C5 on page 247, dynamic displays. There's a several strike throughs which basically um, eliminate uh, all of the rules. I think all of the rules with regard to those and, and some of them, the first one I understand, but second one, display boards shall not emit sound, meaning that if we pass these changes, talking billboards will be a thing in town. Second one, or subsection C, which is the second one I have a question about, the display must be turned off at 11 or at the close of business, whichever is later. Um, that seems like a totally reasonable regulation. I don't see any need to get rid of it. And then the last one, subsection D, um, it says uh, signs must automatically dim in dark conditions. I think that actually might be covered somewhere else in, in the thing, but everything else here makes sense. Those, those changes don't make sense to me. I don't think we should make those changes. Uh, um, Councilor Eller addressed this, but I'm going to let you go back to it. Uh, well, the, if you look above those uh, strikeouts, mm -hmm. Right. The, the language that's in italics, that the signs are prohibited. Mm -hmm. It's a blanket prohibition against the thing. So once you've prohibited them, you don't need to say when they're going to be turned off. Oh, okay. Forgive me. Okay. I missed the word prohibited in that. I thought that the first part of that section was only a definition. So I take back my comments. Great. Is there anybody else who had any questions? Or Yes, Councilor Bullock. I do have a question. So if we're prohibiting these signs, what is happening to the signs that already exist? Because there is, I believe, one on Silver Street. What about like the clock and temperature thing downtown from Greenfield Savings Bank? What happens to those signs? It's on the building department to... Or no, I grandfathered think they're grandfathered in. in they're grandfathered in? Council Disorder has the... Has an answer. I think. It, if it was something that was allowed by the law at that time, it would be grandfathered in. Okay. 
if it was something that was not allowed at the time, and yet it <laughs> was given a permit, which is something that I brought forward, that's a very good question. And there is not enforcement of it. If this is it, the one I'm talking about is 40 square feet, eight by five, blinks, bright red, purple, orange, on and off, faces someone who with a, a history of seizure disorders. And I'm like, you know, it's not okay. But um, so what happens in that instance? Nothing. So and I think that's kind of what we were talking about with the enforcement piece, but I don't think that that's really, um, I mean, that's not us. We're not the enforcers either. That, uh, if I could, that yes. particular sign, you asked uh, Director Torag about it. He actually signed off on it when they put it up. But I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought he said that they uh, were in violation of the of the stuff that's crossed out here. Uh, they should be turning it off at night. Is that right? No, it's in the RA zone. It should not be a intermittent flashing sign at all. They're not allowed in the RA district. So a, a sign of that size is allowed, um, but a, a flashing line of any size in the RA district is forbidden by the current law and it will continue to be that way. And it continues. And, and his answer, if I could, his answer was that um, because he signed off on it, it can't be changed. Is that right? That doesn't make sense. I mean, it's, that he can't do anything about it because he signed off on it. This, this may not be appropriate. Um, it, it's, it's not, it, it is not the one that's at hand. I just, I wanted to point out, I had concerned about the sandwich boards because we have a high population with mobility issues. And there, I actually can't quote the law on how wide the passage is supposed to be on a sidewalk. 36, thank you very much for help over there from my left from Councilor Terenzo. And it, it um, you know, it's, it's an issue um, you know, that had come up at our meeting. Well, what if you were wheelchair bound? Um, could you go into the store and ask them to move that? This would be, you know, but regardless, I do understand why this came forward. It was because it was very labor intensive for the businesses to have to get a sign permit and there was no permanent or semi-permanent where you could have a sandwich board out there every day. It was like you had to do it for one day at a time. So as I said, I'm going to vote in favor of it, but I'm just pointing out that there was an issue with it. We do want to attract and make it easier for our businesses to exist, for them to bring business to town, but you know, things have to go hand in hand. Okay, next I had Councillor Healy. Yeah, I'm just recalling that meeting and I I believe what uh, Eric Torog said was he was going to go investigate it. And then if there was violations, he was going to notify Mark Snow to write a citation, right? Um, and I, I don't have the language in front of me, but I thought in the rural district, that um, residential district, there was some language that like churches and other buildings were exempt from that, but I might be wrong. All right. It, yes. Uh, their their sign they could have is uh, it's the size of the sign they certainly can have 40 square feet they can't blink all right are we ready okay all in favor aye aye any opposed any abstentions councilor lampianski is isn't here Right. Um, and I didn't hear Councillor Mayo. Oh, no, if a councillor is in the hallway, they don't get to vote for that particular vote. But Councillor Mayo is online. 
he, he's got they a have stepped a, away too. He's got a, a still photo up. Okay. So. Um, the motion passes either way. <clears throat> okay. Now we have, I lost my spot. 200-4.2 rural residential district, RC section C, uses by special permit in section 200-7.17, marijuana establishment sections B4. Um, was this EDC again? No. Okay, take it away. Okay, uh, this is um, order number FY23003. The city council moved that it be ordered that the city council of Greenfield pursuant to the provisions of chapter 94G section three of the MGL in order to impose reasonable safeguards on the operation of outdoor and marijuana cultivations and to restrict restrict the licensed cultivation processing and manufacture of marijuana, amend the zoning ordinance chapter 200 as follows. Section 200-4.2, rural residential district RC, section C, uses by special permit is hereby amended by adding the following new section. Quote, 22, marijuana cultivation is limited to tier one, 5,000 square feet pursuant to, uh, Section 200-7.17. Section 207.17 marijuana establishments is hereby further amended by adding to the end of section B4 the following new language. Quote, a marijuana outdoor cultivation is limited to tier one, 5,000 square feet per license. No person or entity having direct or indirect control shall be granted or hold more than three licenses in a particular class. The maximum outdoor canopy permissible under all licenses for a single parcel is 15,000 square feet and further amends the table of contents and index of the code and further that non-substantive changes to the numbering of the ordinance be permitted in order that it be in compliance with the numbering format of the code of the city of Greenfield two-thirds vote required. Second, disorder. Thank you. All right. So I normally don't like to shut down debate, but I feel like we all know what we're doing with this one, correct? So if there are no objections, do, would we like to do you want a report from the committee? Yes, a report from the committee. Uh, like this to? received a positive. <laughs> this received a positive unanimous recommendation from the uh, Economic Development Committee. It received a positive three to one recommendation from the Planning Board. Great, thank you. Um, so, if there are no object, yes. I have a question. Go ahead. So, oh, I'm sorry, my mic's off. My, my question, I think this is a, a, an important step and I've agreed to support it, but my question is why are we going from tier 11 all the way down to tier one instead of tier two or tier three, something like that? Yes. What's yes. the background on that? that? That's a good question. Um, it may be that in the future it gets moved up. It seemed like the simplest way to deal with the situation we had was to go back to what we had before. Uh, frame it as we open the door wider than we meant to, let's go back to what we have and then see if people come forward and say, no, no, we need, we need more and then we can consider it. But this, it was just um, the simplest, more, most straightforward way to deal with the problem that we had. That was the thinking. All right, so I misread the room. Are there folks who have questions about this? Yes. I don't want to, I don't want to say I, I have a question, but I want to reiterate something I said earlier when I addressed the mayor. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm in favor of this, and I will, you know, unless someone gives me a really good reason not to, I, I will be voting in favor of this motion. But I just want to make sure that the city lives up to the promise they made to the people on the Lyden Road property that are in compliance, have followed the directions, have um, the potential to expand their business, even if it's by special permit, that all of that is available to them. I don't want to see anyone come in, make the recommendations, spend the money, think and almost feel like a bait and switch. They told us we could do this. They told us we could expand, then they changed the rules. So as long as we have that um, 
from the city, which we all heard in multiple ways tonight, uh, then I'm then I'm in favor of this. I just don't want it to negatively impact anyone that's already gone through it. And if if there's some that we're not aware of, and that's right. it. Thank you. Um, I need clarification yes. on that. So so, so I, I just, uh, Councilor Gwynn, if, if I may ask for clarification on that. When you said, so the people on, on Leiden Road have what from the city that assures them that this won't affect them? That the, yeah, go ahead. I would just say they already have their permit, which was granted by the authority. As long as that permit's honored with any of the provisions that were there that we're not gonna then say, well, we've changed that ruling. As long as they honor the provisions that were <laughs> available to that group that, that made the investment in Greenfield, then that's what I want. I want to make sure that that we won't go back and say, oh, but we've changed that. You know, like Councillor Elmer said earlier, we're not changing the use. We're just restricting the use edge. You know what I mean? The, the, the way it's, that's all so fine. Does I just something don't wanna... in this language guarantee that the people on Leiden Road get to continue their operation? I would say not in this language, but in their original permitting, as long as that can't be changed or rescinded. And this will not do either of those things. Great. That's what that's what I wanted some reinsurance on for for their investment um, and time that they've put in. Councillor Elmer, were you trying to respond to that, or did you have a? Uh, I, I will say uh, by clarification, they have they have a permit for hundred thousand square feet. If they were to decide to expand, uh, I think they might be limited to 5,000 square feet for each expansion. I don't know that they have a permit oh, to make as many 100,000 square feet uh, grows as they want. Uh, does, that, does that clarify it? Yeah, as long as, as long as the rules didn't change. If they have to go for a special permit, they followed everything we've asked. And, and they've done it you know, they weren't in a situation where they were trying to do anything that wasn't completely upfront and done correctly. So I don't want to negatively impact them. That was my only concern. Okay. Councillor DeSorger and then Councillor Bullock. By law, their special permit needs to be honored. We have already signed off on that. It will be grandfathered. None of us knows the, con none of us here knows the contents of that special permit, but as it was written, it will be honored and grandfathered. So I'm a yes. Okay. And then Councillor Bullock, I saw you next. Yeah, I think that answered my question was what was what is their current permit? At, what does their per current permit allow them to do? And then I guess I would just want to clarify, um, Councillor Gwyn, that you know, we might actually need a legal opinion for this, but I would think if they wanted anything beyond what that current permit is, they would not be eligible to add on to it. But I'm not a lawyer. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You good night. Yeah. Now everyone is going to leave and we're going to have to finish our meeting. They're not even going to know if we file a motion to reconsider. President Gilmore, you could invite them to stay. You're no, welcome to stay. <laughs> okay. You could remind yes, them that there's a possibility of reconsideration. <laughs> That'd be the plot okay. twist at the end. Uh, That'll make them stay. Okay, or I'm, I'm going ahead. Order number FY22. Could, could you guys leave quietly? <laughs> You don't have to go home. Okay. Order number FY22 162. Uh, the City of Greenfield moved that it be ordered that the City Council of Greenfield amend the zoning ordinance chapter 200 to add a new section 7.3 
temporary moratorium on an outdoor marijuana cultivation facilities as indicated by attachment exhibit A and further amends the table of contents and index of the code and further that non-substantive changes to the numbering of the ordinance be permitted in order that it be compliance in compliance with the numbering format of the code of the city of Greenfield, two thirds vote required. Second. Second, Mayo. Thank you. The, uh, do you want to hear the report from committee? Yes, please. This, this got a, neg a unanimous negative uh, recommendation from the Economic Development Committee. If I could explain, this was something that uh, the, uh, the neighbors asked for initially, uh, and then sort of said, no, we'd actually really rather go back to tier one and whatever you do, don't pass this before you pass that change, because then it would all be frozen. Um, so they didn't want it, we didn't want it, we defeated it. Okay. Are there questions? <clears throat> yes. Uh, just wondering if, if, so I understand the plan is to vote this down and I see that as reasonable, but I'm wondering if there also might be wisdom in tabling it indefinitely because if we vote it down, under no circumstances can we bring it up within the next nine months. And if something were to change and we needed it, we might want it to hypothetically be able to be taken up. Just asking the question, I'm happy to go either way. Council Porgy. So I guess I'm going to question the nine month rule. Uh, my understanding of the nine month rule is financial. Um, I, does anybody else know it? Do you know? I think ordinances too, if we vote down an ordinance, I can't come, I can't come back for nine off. months. Red cuts disorder. I do not have my planning book in front of me. However, I will say that as I recall, if you vote something down that is a zoning um, bylaw, no, you can't take it up again. But th the purpose of us voting this down tonight is that they're going to actually look at parameters that go along with this. I would strongly encourage everyone to vote um, against the moratorium right now on the best legal advice that we've gotten from different people, this is the way to go. And the planning board's plan after we did the tier one, so this is a two part thing, so it is important how we vote on this, is that they are going to put in, um, you know, some other safeguards as far as um, you know, setbacks, et cetera. So I would strongly encourage everyone to um, vote the uh, vote no. Vote no. Yes, Councilor. I, I, I can also add that the um, the opinion of the city lawyer was that it wasn't legal. Uh, that if we that um, other towns tried to vote in moratoriums way later than. They, the, the, the state was willing to give towns some leeway when this first came down, but years have passed. People have been given the rules. You can't go then put a moratorium in place. That was the opinion of the lawyer. Okay. Are there any other questions, concerns, thoughts, hopes? Okay. All right. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Maybe you could explain. Change your vote. Okay, Doug. so <laughs> the recommendation from subcommittee was to just vote no. So I will ask one more time. All in favor? All opposed? No. Okay, great. Any abstentions? All right, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, There's the applause Vice First President Gwynn, next we have mayor's appointments. I move that it be ordered that the Greenfield City Council pursuant to charter section 2-10 affirms the following appointments by the mayor. Community Preservation Committee, David Chichester, term to expire June 30th, 2025, planning board designee. Planning and Construction Committee, Mike Pratt, term to expire June 30th, 2025. Planning Board, David Chichester, term to expire June 30th, 2023, moving from an alternate to full member, finishing out Mark Maloney's term. Sustainable Greenfield Implementation Committee, Greta 
Schwarzman. Term to expire June 30th, 2024. Short term to maintain staggered appointments. Majority vote required. Do I have a second? Second, second Ricketts. Wait. This received a positive unanimous recommendation from all uh, A&O present. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Any questions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Abstentions? Great. Okay, so the next one here, I don't, this one didn't go to subcommittee. Um, this was a change in the state law that now the council authorizes police officers um, for the election. So we're going to have a September primary coming up. And it used to be, I, I might get this wrong. It used to be that the uh, chief of police worked with the clerk. Is that how it used to be? He's yes. not here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now the city council has to be involved. So for this year, what we have decided we would do is that we would delegate it to the clerk and the acting chief of police while we adapt to this change. Is that your understanding, yeah. Vice President Gwynn? Yes. Um, I don't know if you want to read the motion before discussion or if, if oh, yeah, there a motion the included. I would like, yeah, maybe I should read the motion. Let me get to the page. 276. Okay. Uh, so the city council moved that it be ordered that the Greenfield City Council is required by the recently passed votes act section 72 assign a sufficient number of police officers up to two to our polling location Greenfield High School gymnasium for all elections primaries held in the calendar year 2022 and authorize the city clerk in coordination with the police chief or a police department designee to assign specific officers for this purpose. Um, so like I said, it didn't go Second. to a subcommittee. Oh, thank you. It didn't go to a subcommittee, so we don't have a recommendation, but that was the rationale. To my understanding, um, there was a change. We weren't sure why. It used to be a very informal thing. The clerk's office would call the police department and say, we have elections, we need X amount of officers, and then they were supplied. Um, there had been some change at the state level that now requires an authorization uh, by the uh, financial body to go along with this, and they're requesting that we follow this um, because it's what the clerk's office is requesting for their uh, safety and public safety, and it's just a new step. And I, I if this had come to my committee, I, I can't see anyone that would have thought this was a bad idea. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, uh, so I have two questions. The first question is, given that it has been assigned to a financial body, does this cost money? Yes. Yes. They, they I mean, it much? costs money in the sense that, that, you know, they're being paid while they're there, yes. But, but they're, they're on, on salary. salary. Are they being paid Excuse extra? Me? There's no line item no, here with any money, so I don't understand how it, it comes to be a financial issue. Vice President Quinn. And, and Councilor Forge, you could answer that. It, it, I mean, if it was overtime hours or something along that line, then they would be paid. If it was part of their normal day, then then it wouldn't happen. So, Councilor Forge. Uh, well, it, my understanding of the way it worked in the past is that it is uh, outside detail. It's an outside detail, and that the money would be taken out of the clerk's budget, and the clerk gets money from the elections, state elections to run her elections, which would be inclusive of the money. Okay, that's good to know. And so if that's the case, why does the city council have to authorize it? I, I have a suspicion, um, if, you, if you read the 900 page typed this, whatever, I have a suspicion that somewhere this law is reactive and somewhere along the line, there must have been some sort of disagreement in town government, okay. like for instance, the council saying, well, why did you hire these people? We didn't authorize it. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm looking at it as it's kind of reactive law. And my final question, why do we need the police to supervise our elections? Because it's the law and we have problems. Yeah. Wait, what? It's the law that we have to have the police supervise our elections? Yes, State problems. State yeah, there have to be police officers present. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. It's good. It's, it's to intimidate voters. 
I don't get it. No, no. So no. that voters don't order. intimidate even counselors. Point exactly. of order. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so regardless of how an individual feels about police officers, the state law says that we do have to have police officers present. It used to be that the clerk would work with the chief to figure out who was being assigned. Now the city council has to step in and add that extra layer. So, so just to be clear, the state has required us to do something, but the state has also required us to vote on whether or not to do the thing they've required us to do. Is that is that really what they're? Yeah, I mean, is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Funded mandate. But yeah, I mean, fun, it's funded it's, or unfunded, they're they're requiring us to do to vote on something. So I saw, already did. Yes, I saw Councillor Ricketts, and then Forgy, and then Toronto, and then it, Vice President Hoyt. Yes, it's it's no different than voting on the ballot. We vote on the ballot every year. Every year too. Oh, we're doing that next. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it, it's that. And as far as the police being there, we have had troubles in the past. Um, we have had a voter. Um, come and attack um, Councillor Stemple and I at an election before. So it's good that we always have police there for anything that may happen. Because sometimes people's names aren't on and the clerk's office is trying to find them and people get all upset because they swear that they are registered and there's just problems that go on. So, but no, there's lots of things. Like I said, the next thing that we're gonna be doing is the ballot itself. We always have to vote on that, even though it's gonna happen no matter what. Mm -hmm. yep. Councillor Forge, I had you next. It's uh, not an unfunded mandate. The money is given through the elections, mm -hmm. um, state elections Good to point. fund. A certain amount of money is given and Kathy has control over the, the, actually the Board of Registrars has the authority over that process. So it's not an unfunded mandate. The state is providing funds. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councillor Tronzo. Uh, I guess mine was kind of simple and probably answered just by it being here, but it sounds like we're going to probably have to do this every year that there's an election because we're just going to have to, this is like a formality. And there's an election every just, year. Um, it's Because this one only says 2022. Mm -hmm. Well, this came up really late. So I think that preparing for next year, knowing ahead of time, it might be something that's just handled with like the president, vice president, and the clerk. Okay. Um, but for this year, this is how we're handling it because we want to be in compliance and we had zero notice and so no planning. Vice President Gwynn. Councilor Forgey answered what I was going to say that the only difference in this is it's not an unfunded mandate, it's a funded mandate. Yeah. <laughs> so better that than the alternative, right? Mm -hmm. um, do I have any other questions? I just want to clarify my earlier comment. I wasn't saying we shouldn't have any police, but what, what I was saying was. Um, it seems silly that the state would order us to vote on something that they've already ordered us to do and we don't have a choice. And I wish they would stop doing that because it wastes our time. I understand. Which is an unfunded mandate, I might add. Well, they say you can wish in one hand, you know. Oh, All right. <laughs> Are there... <laughs> they waste our time. Okay. I still think it's All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Great. And now we're moving on to the warrant. Who wants to read the warrant? On page 299. Councilor Tronza. <laughs> and actually, look out. I, we found a typo in one once. We did. So look. So it's okay. You have to read the whole warrant. Order. No, that was a I found the typo. Okay. Is this this one? Well, on the actual yeah, why are you not done yet? Come on. I mean the order, right? On the oh, okay. Order number FY23-009. The city council moved that it be ordered that that it be ordered. <laughs> the Greenfield City Council hereby approves the attached state primary election warrant for September 6, 2022, and further authorizes the city council president to sign said warrant on behalf of the city council. Majority vote required. Oh, yeah, I have to read the whole. That's okay. Oh, the next one Commonwealth of Massachusetts, William Francis Galvin, Secretary of the Commonwealth, warrant for 2022 state primary 
SS to the constable of the city of Greenfield, greetings in the name of the Commonwealth. You are hereby required to notify and warn the inhabitants of said city who are qualified to vote in primaries to vote at Greenfield High School Gymnasium, 21 Bar Avenue, precincts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 on Tuesday, the 6th day of September 2022 from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. for the following purpose, to cast their votes in state primaries for the candidates of political parties for the following offices, governor for this Commonwealth, lieutenant governor for this Commonwealth, attorney general for this Commonwealth, secretary of state for this Commonwealth, Treasurer for this Commonwealth, Auditor for this Commonwealth, Representative in Congress, Second District, Counselor, Eighth District. That, that's not eighth, a word. Eighth District. Friendly Amendment. Senator in General Court, Hampshire, Franklin, and Worcester District. Representative in General, Second Franklin District. Representative in General Court, Precincts 1 through 4 and 9, Second Franklin District. Representative in General Court, Precincts 5 through 8, First Franklin District. District Attorney, Northwestern District. Sheriff, Franklin County. Hereof, fail not and make return of this warrant with your doings thereon at the time and place of said voting given under our hands this 20th day of July, 2022. City Council President Sheila Gilmore is authorized by vote of the Greenfield City Council by Constable Posting. Constable did posting. Warrant must be posted by August 30th, 2022. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and then we had a friendly amendment, right? We're gonna yeah, change. but I need, to, I need to make the friendly amendment twice because the word counselor That's, is also misspelled. It is. Where is that? Uh, same on the line. left hand side, so it only appears once. Same line. Uh, it's on. I think it's on the same line. Councilor only has one okay. L, so I'd like it to have one L, and it should say the eighth district, which is spelled E I G H T H. Thank you. All right. So. Second. Councilor Mar Sorry, Councilor Forgy. Okay. Um, I don't think Councilor is spelled wrong. It is. There's no, no, whatever, so. no, I think there are two ways to spell oh, counselor. Oh, no. And so um, I I'm, think I'm this is this this is this is I, I don't think it's necessary. That's what I'm saying. This is the way the state has presented the warrant, the way they want it spelled. It's their choice. We tend not to use two L's. We use one L, but it's still a correct spelling. And this that. warrant is being posted. And it's being posted all across the Commonwealth. Google confirms their suspicion. So we should change eighth because it's clearly the eighth district and not the eighth district. Which is not a word. Right. Um, right. Uh, Councilor Lapiansky, would you withdraw your amendment and then make the correct amendment? Um, fine. Uh, I, I, I don't I don't agree, but I don't care. Uh, my wait, do we have to have a, a second and a vote for a friendly amendment such as a spelling error? I don't think we do. Oh no. So just my, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna change it to correct the eighths to make it eighth, whatever the correct way that that's spelled according to the state of Massachusetts. And if you want to have a second, fine, but I don't think we need it. Great. All right. Are there any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay, it passes. We're going to have a primary. Yeah. And now I will sign it. Can't wait. Do we? Can I sign it with a typo? Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay. Presentation of petitions and similar papers. Report of committees. Is there anybody who wants to give a report of their committee? Nope. Unfinished business. Yes. So uh, I have some unfinished business and I also have some old business. The unfinished business is very simply this. I should have mentioned this earlier, but I didn't understand what was going on. I want to make it clear that GCTV says that they had nothing to do with the technical errors. They do not control that screen. They have nothing to do with Zoom. All they do is watch it like us. It was a failure of IT. And I can't remember who said that it was a failure of GCTV, but whoever said that knew for a fact when they said it that that was a lie and they shouldn't be doing things like that. Okay. And I guarantee it was a lie. It was not a misstatement. It was, it was actively smearing GCTV for the good work that they do. Uh, Councilor Almer. Can, can I request that we refrain as much as possible from using the word lie? Yeah. It's very pejorative and we don't, it, it assumes that we know motivations that we may not know. I'm not going to withdraw that statement. Um, I 
I will say regardless of whose fault it was that the technology went out, I'm very, very happy that it came back. I know that someone was working, it wasn't the technology fairy. And thank you, Tammy, for uh, sitting through this rough night with me. <laughs> okay. And I have some old business as well. Counselor, just, but, oh, I'm still on unfinished business. Counselor Disorder? Okay. Old business, Councilor Lekowski. Well, go, go ahead and do your old business and then I'll. I just wanted to say um, the motion to table on the audit, I had a comment on that. For those of you who are not at Ways and Means. Oh, your mic went out. <laughs> One mic. <laughs> okay. Director Gilman was fabulous. And in the month that's coming up, if you have any suggestions, they were welcomed by both the mayor and this has been a cooperative uh, affair. So if you had suggestions to put in for the language, Director Gilman was sort of welcoming that. And I just wanted to announce that also. Um, there was good discussion at the meeting about the figure because there were cities that had done this for 25, 30,000, like Milwaukee. And someone, um, you know, we had a couple of different suggestions. Um, 60,000 was the one that I liked. And I just think you might want to listen to a little bit of that discussion, but by all means, put your ideas forward because for this to pass, it's the you know negotiation and people working together, and that was welcomed on the executive side. That was my comment. Thank you, Council Lapiansky. Yeah, so um, I'd like to move that uh, beginning August first, all city council subcommittees be in person and or hybrid. I'll second that. I'm sorry, you seconded. Bottomly. Thank you. So that's a um, that's a decision that we're going to make at committee chairs. Um, if people want to discuss it tonight, I'm happy to have a discussion. Um, the chair is not eligible to prevent us from voting on it. But I decide where we meet. So if we want to talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it. Yes. Um, personally, I'm just going to say. When we have ways and means for the budget season, um, I'm on two subcommittees. I had meetings like every single night. I think in the month of April and May, um, well, not the weekends, but it was night after <laughs> night after night. And I um, welcomed the opportunity to be doing that in a remote fashion. I certainly want the public to be able to be a part of this because I believe in that, but it's on television. I actually think we've got terrific participation from folks who could participate remotely. And um, this is a job where we give our blood, sweat and tears hours after hours. I, I, to me, it was like a 60 hour a week job. And to have to leave every night that I, tonight I came early to help with the chairs and was eating my dinner sitting here. I, I think it's a lot to ask when there's that many nights. And I, additionally, there were people that spoke about this before who traveled. Um, I can think, I'm looking at your faces now. Um, there were people with youngsters, there were um, people that traveled, there were people that were visiting family, and, you know, there's only so much you can give, so I would not be in favor of that. I like that we have this big meeting together, and hopefully we're going to work out the IT part of it. Yes. Um, I just want to be upfront that if uh, hybrid is not an option for um, for meetings, I will need to resign from, from city council. I'm unable to participate in that many evenings away from my house and my job and I travel for work. So it'll mean that I'll be excluded. Yes. 
Um, to restate, the motion was that subcommittee meetings be in person and or hybrid, which is the same as what these meetings are. But that would that would then require one person to, at least one person to be in person. Is that true? So under the so under the the current order of the governor, oh gosh, I'm going to get this wrong. So at the beginning of the pandemic, they allowed us to meet remotely, and that's why we've been able to you know get through the last couple of years and be able to you know vote on these things that we need to vote on. They extended the order and I have not read it word for word. So I would need a little bit of guidance on that. But my understanding now is that if we wanted to, we could meet fully remote if we wanted to. And we have to provide a hybrid option because we voted to put in that hybrid option back in February, I believe. It was earlier this year. Yeah. So we need to provide that option no matter what's going on, but we could be fully remote if we chose to. And Councillor Healy. My question was kind of answered, but I also, um, in, in line, I travel a lot for work and I have six kids in my house and um, it, it'd be troublesome for me to be to, at, at every meeting. And again, if it's, if it's hybrid, what if there's no counselors here and just the public, how, how does that work, right? So um, I, I just think it sets a bad precedence. Okay, so this is something that we do discuss at uh, committee chairs every month, and we're kind of like taking people's pulse if, um, I mean, counselors can always send something to the clerk's office and then say, just could you forward this to the committee chairs if you want to, you know. I'm yeah, sorry? I don't really understand why we can't do it now. Just because she doesn't want to let us it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so first I saw Councillor Bullock, and then I saw Councillor Forgey. So I just want to say that I I did just skim the new um, regulations that came. I haven't read them in depth, but I do believe that we need to have someone in person. So then I guess the question is, Councillor Pianski, like, are you willing to show up to subcommittee meetings and be the one that's in person? That would work for me. So, so uh, first of all, yes, but se and, and I'm on currently on appointments and ordinances and CRE, Community Relations and Education. I'm not good with my acronyms. Um, my opinion is that generally speaking, um, so I'm, I'm actually unclear on our own rule. I, th I think there might be a provision in our own rule, which we could amend if necessary, that says that a quorum has to be physically present, but I'm not totally sure about that, but we could amend that if that's what it took for subcommittees. Um, my opinion is that it would be preferable, maybe not have to be, but preferable if the committee chair was in person at least much of the time. It would, I think it would function better that way. But again, like giving people the option is always gonna be better. Um, both because I don't use technology, but also because there are a very large number of members of the public, many of whom have contacted me saying they can't participate because of that. And it's gotten better now that they can come here and do public comment, but they don't know what goes on at subcommittees. Um, so just, just let me finish this. No, so actually, I'd recognize Councillor Forgey. I let you speak because oh, Councillor Bullock so had sorry. named you. No, that's fine. So you answered her question. Then I have Councillor Forgey, then Councillor Ricketts. Uh, Vice President Gwynn, did I see your hand go up? Okay. Forgey, Ricketts, Gwynn. I pulled up the open meeting law update from the Division of Open Government. Basically, it says that um, they have extended the expiration of the provisions pertaining to open meeting law to March 31st, 2023. Specifically, this allows public bodies to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location and to provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings doesn't make, the act does not make any new changes in open meeting law other than extending the expiration date of the temporary revision uh, provisions regarding remote meetings. So we are good to go by state law until next March. 
Thank you. And I had Councillor Ricketts. Yes. Um, yeah, I love having our council meetings in person. It's good to see department heads and the mayor, everyone, school committee here. But I would like all the subcommittees to stay remote. I think it's easier. And I don't know who's been contacting you, but I go to most of the committee meetings. You know, I didn't go to Ways and Means last night, but that was the first one I've missed probably in a couple of years. And I'm not even on that committee. And I always look at the participation list and the participation list for all these subcommittees have been really full. So I don't know who's been contacting you, but they've been there. They have been at lots of subcommittee meetings. So it's working right now this way. The people and who don't I have like, computers and have you not know what? been I'm there. sorry, no, Councillor Ricketts speak. has the floor right now. Yeah. And so I just feel like we just need to check in and let it be more of the councilors talking because as well, you may not know, but I'm going to let you know that I get a ton of email about everything and about our meetings is not something that I've been getting any emails on, but I get it on everything else. So people are very vocal. And so let's tackle the stuff that are real problems for us. This doesn't seem to be a problem and this is what's working for us. So I'd like to keep it this way because I'm telling you budget season and other meetings is really rough because it is a lot of nights and I go to as many meetings as I can. So I understand how to vote. Okay, Vice President Gwynn, I had you next. I was just going to say, um, with the limitations at committee, uh, at our committees, committees historically, only people that do attend a committee meeting are people that are somehow attached directly to the agenda. Mm -hmm. And they're either an invited guest. We don't allow public comment at the committee level. They have to be invited. So that's already the process we've always followed. When I was the chair of EDC long ago, the only people that came were the people that were on our agenda. We didn't have, unless there was a hot topic and then, then we had a public hearing and we gave that availability, just like EDC just did with the marijuana situation where they had a public uh, meeting and, and, they, and they allowed people to speak. But as a general rule, the people that are coming to those meetings, we get more people watching a &O, um, when they can access it um, than, than we ever had come to an a and meeting. Uh, so, so I don't think it's a problem right now. In fact, I think we're allowing more people uh, to, to uh, come to the meeting. And also I watched the other counselors and I think it's very telling when there's someone as dedicated as like Councillor Ricketts, where I see her jump three meetings on the same night. And, and she's not going to be able to do that if she's in one room and has, you know, wants to do an hour of ways and means and do an hour of school committee or whatever. So uh, I think what we're doing right now is not really broken. Okay, next I had Councillor Healy and then Councillor Golub. Well, I think we've accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish. So I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. You can't. We're in the middle of a motion. Can, can I, I do that? I love you, though. <laughs> Next, I had. No, because we have a we have a motion on the floor. Yeah. Was that seconded though? I don't think it was. Yes, it was seconded. Oh. Yeah. We've been discussing it. We can't go into discussion if it's so, a second. Can I Counselor, call the question? Yeah. Right now, Councilor Gollum has Council 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 the floor. Yeah. I might call the question. Um, I'm not sure about process, but I just a couple of thoughts. One, accessibility is incredibly important and the barriers to joining council are already incredibly high. So I would not support increasing the barriers. Um, and two, as a facilitator, if the meetings were to be divided with half of the people and having to be in the room and the other half on Zoom, the congeniality and rapport that exists on this council right now, I'm like, I'm very impressed and very grateful to be joining the council at this moment. And having the room physically divided would not support us. Um, 
And I do, I want to note that ongoing, I do think that hybrid meetings um, for the general council meeting, that's something that I support for accessibility into the future. I know that's not on the table, but I just want to name that that's important. Um, so I support Zoom subcommittee meetings, and I support this, also this opportunity for the congeniality and getting to be in the room physically together once a month is important, I think. So I don't know about process, but I would like to have a vote on this. And I don't know if that's a motion or- So you I, would move to call the question. I move to call the question. Do we have a second? Oh, do I have a second? Okay, great. All right, all in favor. Uh, okay, hold on. So the motion was to return to fully in-person meetings. So all in favor to return to fully in-person meetings. No, it's to call the question. Oh, I'm sorry. We're voting to call the question. I'm tired. Okay. And, a yes and, vote means we're going to vote, and a no vote means we're going to keep talking. All in favor? Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, great. So we're calling the question. And roll call, please. Okay. It's not debatable. So a yes vote is to return to in person. A no vote is to continue the model that we've been working on and to keep it in. Uh, but it will be on committee chairs every month. So, Councilor Golub? No. Vice President Gwynn? No. Councilor DeSorger? No. Councilor Bottomley? Yes. Councilor Bullock? No. Councilor Lapiansky? Yes. Councilor Mayo? No. Councillor Healy? No. Councillor Elmer? No. Councillor Forgy? No. Councillor Ricketts? No. Councillor Taranzo? Nope. Motion fails. Okay, it'll be on committee chairs and we'll reassess in a couple of weeks. All right. That was old business. Do I have any new business? Oh yes, Councilor Forgy. Thank you very much. Before we end this meeting, I want to just say thank you to Tammy. This absolutely. Is, this is quite. This is uh, quite a different venue for her, and I think you've done a great job, and I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you tonight. <laughs> yeah, she had a rough start today too. <laughs> Just a little. Councilor Toronto. <laughs> I guess this was still probably old business, um, but I thought it should be addressed because it did come in through um, after uh, our last meeting was the, um, I guess, demand letter from the the uh, attorney of who owns the property behind Legion Ave um, on that financial order that we declined to fund for the completing the paving on there. And I just wanted to, um, I don't know how we bring that back up. Uh, it was, it, Councilor uh, or Vice President Gwynn kind of, uh, when, when he, his concern about us not um, holding to our words, so to speak on the, uh, the, the Leiden Road uh, marijuana permit that's already been approved. Um, it, it, it I almost heard the same echoing of what I was talking about when it came to this was honoring our word on something we've already said we were going to do before. And we, we had heard that there was potential for litigation if we didn't uphold that. Um, I was very confused after we got kind of like more evidence that we should be paying for this, that then the vote got worse. <laughs> um, which was very strange to me because I had much more support before we had any documentation that even <laughs> inferred that we should hold up this expense. And I guess I'm just, um, I don't know if it has to come from the mayor again as a financial order, but I would really like to not have to waste money on litigation over repaving something that we made a bunch of money on. Um, I'd rather pay for the paving than a lawyer is what I'm saying. So I don't know if that's something that we have to bring back up or no, if the, the or I will on record say I would like it to be brought back up as a, a way for us to pay 
Um, or, okay, I will on record encourage <laughs> that the mayor um, present us with another financial order. And I would also encourage um, us as a council to re-entertain that with a different look because if we're gonna have to waste money on litigation and I'm pretty sure we're gonna lose this one. I'm not a lawyer either, but this is, this is it's, a bad, it's a bad handshake agreement. And I would be really irritated if I were the owner of that property. Um, so and, and so I, that was just, that was my old business. But I don't know how we, I'm just saying, I think we should revisit that in whatever way possible. I've got a lot of people raising their hands, but I will tell you, it's going to be nine months before that can come back. Sure. So it yes, Councilor Forgey. Um, I, I understood that the letter that came back from Mr. Grader uh, asked a reduced amount be provided to, uh, at, at this particular point that it changed to, uh, instead of a $60,000 request, it changed to a $39,000 request or litigation. So my opinion is that the mayor can bring that back because it's a new reiteration of what we voted on to reduced amount. So she can bring it back. Mm. Okay. Councilor Ricketts. Um, I'm going to go off topic. <laughs> Um, I would like, and this is for Tammy, could I please dedicate a page in tonight for Officer Donut, please? Officer, I'm sorry? Clarence, right? Clarence, I mean, yeah. The police dog that recently passed. Okay. So could you please dedicate a page? Am I allowed to object to that? Um, um, this isn't something that we would normally vote on or object to. No. No, I, I, I think I think that's just such a weird thing to do. Okay, thank you, Tammy. It's it's sort of a tradition. Okay. Um, I mean, I can find anybody who serves to... the city. So we're happens. okay. We're not going to argue over something like this. The next month. All right. I'll find the next. Weird to dedicate do I have to. any other new business? Do I have motions for? Rec I'm sorry. Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Mm -mm. All right. All in favor. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh, have a wonderful night, everybody.